August 31st, full committee meeting to order. Uh, I think I uh, speak for the committee. Uh, this is in the right in the top three favorite uh, nights for us. Uh, if we please get the opportunity to, to uh, see our new, new, new teachers and, and staff. Uh, so welcome. Uh, hope you had a good first day. Or uh, what was it, a full day today? Today was open day. So, great. You want me? Yeah. This is actually their sixth day. <laughs> Last week, uh, our new teachers were part of uh, the Reading Education Induction Institute, um, which uh, was put together, designed by Craig, and several people participated in that. And I believe there's an agenda in your packet of the different activities that were in uh, during those, those five days. Um, it is a great opportunity for, for new teachers to understand the culture of Reading and, and to learn a little bit about the nuts and bolts before they, they go into it um, on the first day today. So um, I want to thank everyone for being here tonight. Um, I was able to work with them a couple of times last week, and I have to tell you, this is a great group, great group of teachers, um, a lot of great questions that they ask, and I'm um, looking forward to seeing them during the school year working with our students. Uh, for the beginning introductions, I'm going to start first with the Barrows Elementary School. Heather, Heather Leonard. Heather is going to model for you, for everyone else, how we're going to stand in front of the camera. Perfect. Obviously elementary, right? There's one beautifully. Thank you for having us tonight. I am so excited about this year as a whole, and we have a really great group of staff joining us at the Barrett Elementary. Um, so starting to my right, this is Mr. Andrew Hurley. Um, he is a fifth grade teacher joining us this year to be teaching math and writing. He received his elementary education degree at Stone Hill, and he worked for nine years doing this intervention and support work with elementary and middle school students. During that time, he received his Master's of Arts in teaching, as well as his principal and assistant principal certification. And he joined us at Barrows last year as a tutor, and we were lucky enough to grab him and hang on to him for this year and uh, have him join us as a classroom teacher in fifth grade. So welcome, Andrew. Um, next, we have Julie Gilchrist. Julie is joining us. She's actually a resident of Reading. She's lived here for 17 years. She has two students in the Reading school system. Prior to joining the Barrows, Julie was a teacher in Wakefield for five years, um, and she received her Master's in Teaching from Leslie. And she taught in Wakefield for five years and then relocated to California for, with her family for a year, and they have come back to the East Coast. And we were lucky enough to scoop Julia, Julia up to join us in third grade. Um, to her right, this is Mary Halliday. Mary is our Special Education um, Learning Center teacher. She graduated from UMass Boston with her master's in education and a master's in special ed. Uh, and outside of work, she likes to explore country, other countries, work with shelter dogs, and spend time outside. So we're excited to have Mary joining us. And a little history, Mary's mom was actually, for a period of time, a music teacher at Barrows many years ago. Oh, wow. So, yes, so kind of a cool connection. Uh, and, and last in our line is Bethany Granoff. Bethany is our half day kindergarten teacher. Um, Bethany, prior to her life as an educator, um, was actually a singer and dancer on Carnival and Flying Ships. So, <laughs> our cabin <laughs> shows are going to be nice. We know who to ask for next year. We've been practicing with it. Um, so, she did that for about eight years when she met her husband, and in 2013 decided to come back and her career in education. So she got a master's in education in early childhood from Gordon, and she worked as a paraprofessional in the Amesbury Top School School Systems prior to joining us at Barrows. Um, she's done a wonderful job setting up her classroom for her students, and it just went to go and looks great. Mm -hmm. We also have joining us Marissa Holt, who um, is her second year in the district prior to joining us at Barrows. She was a sixth grade science teacher here at Coolidge, and she's now joining us as another fifth grade teacher in our team. And additionally, we have a long-term sub named Sarah Forward, who is covering one of our first grade classes for the fall. So I am so excited to introduce our new staff members with all their wonderful energy, and thank you for letting us come and share. Thank you. Thank you. I would like.
like to introduce to you the associate principal for the Birch Meadow Elementary School, Patty Beckman. This is Patty's first official meeting. And Patty will be introducing her staff, her new staff. I'm so excited to be introducing some of our new staff at Birch Meadow Elementary. At Birch Meadow is just such a wonderful group of teachers. Anyway, we're all, they're all so dedicated and caring and um, have lots and lots of energy. And so we're really excited that we have two new members that are also going to show their energy. Right here is Emily Wilson. Emily, we're excited to have her along with us. Both her undergraduate and her master's degree are in special education. Um, allow her and her diverse experience that she's had in many schools, allow her to come to us and co-teach in our second grade classroom. And we're so excited to have her. And next to her is Carrie Ann Bartley. And Carrie Ann has been working in special education with a diverse group of students. And both her undergraduate degree and master's degree are from Marist College. And so we're thrilled to have Carrie Ann as part of our learning center this year. So welcome. We also have another um, half day kindergarten teacher that joined us and wasn't able to be here with us tonight, Nisha Turner. Nisha is a graduate of Bentley College. <clears throat> she also has her MBA from Bentley, and she'll be a great asset to our half day kindergarten program. So welcome, and we're so glad to have you on board. Eric Sprung, Joshua Eaton Elementary School, will now introduce his new staff. Okay, I'm excited to be part of the Joshua Eaton community this year. Uh, the staff has really welcomed me and uh, showed me around, showed me the ropes, and it's very invigorating when you come into a new building and see the energy and enthusiasm uh, that the staff has shown. And, and so it's uh, a great honor and privilege to introduce teachers uh, that are going to be part of that great Joshua Eaton community that we have. Uh, starting here next to me is Brittany Conan, um, and I know Brittany as Brittany Barr because she actually um, came to Reading through Birch Meadow. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm very fortunate to have Brittany with me as a special education uh, co-teacher when we had a teacher that was out for a period of time. Brittany uh, received her degree from Messiah College. Uh, and she went from Birch Meadow to Joshua Eaton, where she was working as a learning center teacher for the past few months, filling in while somebody was out on leave. So uh, we're very fortunate to have Brittany with us. And next to Brittany, uh, we have Adam DeRosier. So Adam graduated from UMass <coughs> Amherst, got his master's degree from Bridgewater State. Uh, he's been working in Hingham as a fifth grade teacher. And so we are very fortunate to have him teaching fifth grade. These are all fifth grade teachers that are here today. And we have Kelly Partiman. So Kelly graduated from Simmons College with her master's degree and got her undergraduate degree from North Carolina State University. Uh, she came to us from Everett, where she has been a classroom teacher uh, for many years, doing fourth, fifth, sixth grade uh, since 2000. So quite a long teaching experience. So uh, we're excited to have these three people here. Um, Adam and Brittany actually are newlyweds, just got married this summer, which is very exciting. <laughs> 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 Kathy Giles, the principal at Killam, uh, her staff member is not here, but I, she does at least want to introduce the new staff member. Elementary school for now nine years, um, but I've been around in Reading for 23 and was 
really cool is that Jamie Chamberlain, <laughs> my 0.5 kindergarten teacher, uh, graduated from Endicott, and I actually supervised her back at Barrows, uh, I think 12 years ago. And so she started off at Barrows uh, in Reading, Joanne King, principal at Wood End. Doug Lyons, the principal at Parker Middle School, will be next. <laughs> so between retirements, first, thank you for having us. We appreciate the rating. So between our four retirements last spring and some late opportunities for teachers in the summer at Parker, we welcome nine new faculty members to Parker. A lot of girls. We just don't have that many. Um, that the first one couldn't be here this evening. She has three children under the age of five, so she's home with them. She lives in Reading. Her name is Maria Morgan. She's our reading specialist. She did her undergraduate work at UMass Amherst, her graduate work, her first graduate degree at Boston College, and her second graduate degree she did at Reading next day. She has two certifications, one in social studies and history for middle school, where she was initially a middle school social studies teacher until she became a reading specialist uh, and comes to us from the Arlington Middle Schools. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Kim Bernazani. Um, 
Dr. Kimber and I is one of two new school psychologists that we welcome as part of the middle school this year. Kim completed her doctorate at St. John's. Her undergraduate work was done at Boston College. She's from this area and is coming back to us after living in Tucson, Arizona. Her husband is a military pilot and will be coming back after he completes his commitment very shortly. But we're very fortunate to have her joining our staff. Um, also in the guidance office is Alexa Napa, who is a two-time degree holder from Tufts University. She just completed the, the site program at Tufts and her internship at the middle school in Winchester. Um, so between Kim's years of experience um, and Alexa being new, um, we think that they're going to kind of match up really well and kind of really do great in our guidance department. Next up, we welcome Allie Donlin who is going to be our sixth grade language-based teacher. Happy to say she's a, a graduate of Parker Middle School in RMHS. Yeah. Yeah. She, did her, yeah. Yeah. she did her undergraduate work at Manhattan College, got her graduate degree at Leslie, and has been teaching for the last three years in the language-based program in Lowell. So to have someone with language-based experience come back to Parker um, and work in the program is it's just really a terrific hire for us. Next, we welcome Catherine Kirshning, couldn't be here this evening. She has our, this is her first night of her graduate class. Mm -hmm. And so yes, and so she is a seventh grade science teacher. She did her undergraduate work at Emanuel. She did her first graduate degree at UMass Lowell, and she's working on her second graduate degree in education at Merrimack College. But she will be taking the place of Jake Barnett in grade seven science. Jake went to Pack and Boxborough to teach high school science. We knew that that was going to happen. It was just a matter of so next up, we have two new math teachers. Um, both did their undergrad work at Boston University. We welcome Brian Walsh. Uh, Brian, excuse me, Brian did his undergraduate at Lehigh and a graduate at Boston U. And Nick Turpine did his undergraduate at Boston U. Nick is not new to Parker. Nick was a long-term sub last year, and we were fortunate to hire him to come back this year Brian Walsh for the last three years has been teaching middle school math in Medford and is also a resident of Reddit. So we're really pleased to be able to hire them. Next, in our learning center, we welcome another Reading resident. Um, she worked for the last three years in the language based program, did her undergraduate work in Curry, and got her graduate degree from Leslie as well. And so her name is Kim Moreau, and she for the last three years has been in the language based program at Wakefield. But when she's joining us, she's going to be seventh grade learning center. Please be able to hire her. And last but not least, makes number nine, I hope, um, <laughs> which is Julie Cohen. Julie Cohen is a veteran language teacher. She has taught in, in many systems and many, she's been teaching ESL, Hebrew, Spanish. She's kind of done it all. And she comes to us with a wealth, a, a wealth of middle school experience. She's going to be teaching Spanish half the time in our Before um, I ask uh, Sarah to come up, um, I just want to acknowledge, as, as most of you know, uh, Doug Lyons will be uh, leaving us shortly. He'll be the assistant superintendent for the Wakefield Public Schools. Um, we are certainly going to miss Doug and his professionalism and his dedication to the Reading Public Schools in, um, in the 11 years that he's been administrating this school district. So Doug, I want to thank you for your service here. Wish you the best of luck in, in Wakefield. Sarah, sorry, I did.
Have Mr. Adam Bacher introduce the high school staff. Last but by no means 
Lease. For those of you who were able to attend tonight, I'd like to introduce Megan Howie, who's joining our social studies department with 11 years experience as a social studies teacher from Whitman Hanson High School. Uh, Megan holds a BA from Bridgewater State University and a master's in history from the University of Massachusetts in Boston. She's also looking forward to working with many different clubs and activities. We're excited to have her as well. Uh, Folks who could not join us tonight, we have Bristol Lieber, our, who's joining us as a physics teacher. She brings seven years of physics and biology experience from the Boston Public Schools. Also, Dan Donato, who's joining our English department, brings five years of experience, two years in English, and three as a guidance counselor from the Malden Public Schools. I uh, also like to introduce Colleen Griffin Rowland, who will be joining the math department. She brings many years of experience teaching math at both the middle and high school level. We have Beatrix Murphy, who comes to Reading with three years of teaching experience and is teaching Spanish with us this year. She spent one year at Wilton Public Schools and two years with New Milford High School. Also, Peter Salzman will be teaching physics in high school this year. Has 10 years experience in education, a range of public and private high schools. He's taught physical, and, uh, physical science and earth science classes, as well as physics and is a professional geologist for a period of time in environmental consultant. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Michelle Hintian, who is joining us as our speech and language pathologist. She has experience as a student clinician at Cambridge Health Alliance and is a graduate of RMHS. Uh, and we have two special other employees. I'd like to introduce Samantha Pindara, who is joining us as our student support board to help students returning from different hospitalizations and helping them get back on track. She worked as a paraeducator at the with Public Schools recently graduated from Springfield College of Major in History, and is currently uh, pursuing a graduate degree in counseling. And last, but by no means least, uh, Mr. Mike McSweeney was not able to join us. He's actually working on scheduling. <laughs> he's, he's transitioned from his role as department head in English to assistant principal. Uh, he is also a graduate of RMHS, as many of you know, and has entered his 18th year as an educator, and has spent the last 12 years as a department head, so we're very excited to have him. Thank you so much for having us. I really appreciate your time. We also have some district staff that we'd like to introduce to you. We'll start first. Carolyn Wilson is going to introduce some new special education staff. You can do that. Yes. Got it. Thank you. Um, and she is also local, living in Andover, and excited about having a much 
I apologize, there was one school I forgot. I was gonna raise my hand. <laughs> Rise Peary School. Yeah. Debbie Butts. have one more set of introductions, sorry. Craig is going to introduce, Craig, Craig is going to introduce our two new coaches. Literacy has always been her passion. She has a master's in reading, language, and special education. She's participated in the trainings that Columbia University has also been offering in reading and writing, and she's been very involved in our district's trainings and summer workshops and writer's workshop. She's been a curriculum leader in ELA and literacy for our district, and she's also completed the NISL program, NISL, which is the National Institute for School Leadership. So we welcome Tricia into this new role. And then second, next to me here is our K-8 math coach, Karen Brown, who has 13 years in education. She is very passionate about STEM education. She has experience developing math, scope and sequence aligned to the state framework and has worked with teachers to implement the Singapore math strategies in their classrooms. She's coming most recently from Lawrence, but prior to that has taught uh, math in Salem for 12 years. She has a Master's of Arts in teaching mathematics and the focus of her CAGS was increasing teacher collaboration which is very appropriate for where we are right now in our district and things we're working on. So I welcome both of them to this role. Robinson. I just wanted to say that I am just so impressed with the energy of the group and the diversity of educational backgrounds, different districts, different types of districts, um, your professional degrees, the number of degrees, the amazing uh, caliber of the universities, and the professional certifications. And I'm just, I'm, I'm really impressed. I'm really excited. Uh, I think it's a tall order coming to Reading because these administrators have really high expectations. And um, our, our students, are, they're great learners. And, I, and not, not every single one is gonna be excited every day, but there, a lot of them are very excited and really wanna excel. And the parents demand a lot from us here in Reading for their kids. So um, you're signing up for a challenge, but I am totally impressed with this group of teachers and really excited about it. And wish I had younger kids, but I have a senior, my last one. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Robinson, I just want to say uh, one more thing with you just reminded me. I, our administrators have spent a significant amount of time this summer uh, with the hiring process, as you can see. I also want to thank, I think she's still here, right? Michela Saunders, our human resources administrator, who all of the paperwork goes through.
through Michela. Oh, wow. um, so it, there is a tremendous, I mean, we hired not, uh, not just including teachers, but probably over 75 staff between paraeducators, substitute teachers, custodians, food service, and teachers. So there's a lot of hiring <coughs> that has been going on this summer. And so between our principals and Michelle, I want to say thank you wow. for your efforts. Thank you. <laughs> We want to take a uh, two-minute recess. Thank you.
like to call the uh, meeting back to order. Uh, the rest of the evening will proceed with as follows, public input uh, reports, and I think there's quite a few of them. Uh, the second readings of policies, uh, GCCD and JKKA, uh, the post program update, a budget update, and then uh, uh, gifts and donations, and then the uh, superintendent's evaluation. So uh, I now open it up to public input. Uh, we have not received any date on when the park schools will be ready. Most likely right now we're looking at late October, early November. like to do, um, since we, we haven't met much as a committee this summer, uh, we would like to, a, up to a, uh, like to update you on several of the things that have been going on in our district this summer so that you have a full picture. It's been, uh, as, as I said today with um, our opening day, my opening day remarks, 
Uh, we've had 66 days between the last day of school and the first day of school um, today for teachers. And a lot's been going on. Um, and so what we want to do this evening is we've, we've broken it down into some categories. First, the facilities. Martha's going to talk about the different facilities uh, updates and the areas that we have uh, been working on this summer. Uh, I'm going to focus on some of the things that our district leadership team has been doing. Uh, Craig is going to talk about learning and teaching. And Carolyn is going to talk about what's been happening with student services. And then I'm going to go back and there, there's some uh, other information I want to share with you that really didn't fit into any of those categories. Um, but we felt was important to share with you this evening. So uh, this is going to take a few minutes, but I think it's all important information to show the types of things that have been going on um, in our school district this summer. So I'm going to start first with facilities. That's kind of tiny, but Martha, if you want to. Yeah, oh, thank you. Um, so, you know, um, as, as Dr. Doherty said, we've had 66 days between the last day of school and, and the start this year. And in addition to all the, the great work that I'm going to touch upon up there, our custodians have, have stripped every floor, waxed every floor, and to do that, they have to remove every piece of furniture, and every piece of furniture gets completely cleaned as well. Um, they replaced every air filter in the building, so there's been a lot of work that's gone on by our custodial staff. In addition to all that, these projects have happened as well. So um, the modular classroom project, um, although it's been delayed, we do expect to occupy them mid to late September. Um, and we do have temporary classrooms set up in the gymnasium that Barrows, Eaton, and Killam. Um, the Eaton Roof Project, um, while it's under budget, well under budget, um, it's a little bit delayed due to some rain uh, weather delays over the summer. Um, the, the masonry work is, has been completed and the roofing work will be completed, substantially complete by September 5th. Um, the Parker Roof Repair will begin uh, they're going to begin the <coughs> scaffolding uh, this week, and uh, they estimate about 16 days worth of masonry work, and then about three to four days of roof repair, so that project will be completely completed by September 30th. Um, the retaining wall has been completed. Anyone who's come by the high school mm -hmm. can see that it's completely done. Um, again, we are under budget on that one as well, um, and uh, we expect a, actually a, a sizable credit back from the vendor because we didn't pave as much of the parking lot as we had originally had in the scope of the project. So there's a significant savings there, as well as being under budget with the bidding process. There's even a little bit more coming back to the district. That project, I'll remind you, is being funded by debt. So um, the retaining wall is by debt. Um, <coughs> tiling and flooring has been done throughout the district, as you can see in here. This is new carpeting here in the, the, uh, the media center. Um, interior walls were painted in a number of classrooms. And then uh, a large project at the high school, this was a capital project, was the hot water heater. Um, when I was talking with Kevin Gerstner this morning about this project, he wanted me to be sure and say that this is a energy efficient and we hope to see savings on our gas bill as a result of yeah. the upgrade to this, uh, this water heater. So twofold benefit there. Um, other projects that have been completed over the summer, we have, like I've mentioned, we've had painting at a lot of the schools. Um, the gutter replacement at Barrows is significant in that um, the, the horrific winter that we suffered through last year created, and, and I can see uh, nodding, yep. created unbelievable ice hanging from the roof. And so these gutters are new, they're replaced, so that should uh, alleviate that problem at Barrows. Mm -hmm. um, Birch Meadow, we had an office renovation. We used a, uh, a space that previously, I'm not sure what was in it previously. But um, John Cotter on our maintenance staff uh, built a great office for our team chair here at Birch Meadow. She's very happy about that. Um, wood end, we replaced the gutters and, and wood end, um, the back of wood end, so it's not visible when you come up the driveway, but the back of wood end was the last of the sides of the building that needed to be painted again. Um, as a wood structure, it needs to be painted every five to six years and, and the back was in desperate need of a paint job. So that's where the painting was there. Um, and I'll just touch on a couple more. Um, <coughs> at the high school, there's a number of projects at the high schools, particularly in the field house. They've replaced the motors that lower and raise the, um, the backdrops for basketball. They replaced all the lamps. Um, we did an upgrade in the PAC center with uh, the AV system. And um, that's about it. And the sprinkler repair in the high school in the field house as well. 
So a lot, lot list, a long list, rather. Thank you. One more. I'm sorry. So does anybody have any questions? Okay. So I want to I want to share with you um, some of the things that our district leadership team, which includes uh, principals, assistant principals, team chairs, uh, central office leadership. Um, we spent six days together this summer. The strategy we always use is to have a couple of days at the beginning of the summer, talk about the th things that we felt were successful this year, things that we felt um, we could have done better. And then we spend four days in August together. Um, some of it is in a retreat-like atmosphere. Um, others it's to to talk about some of the issues that we're going to be facing for the upcoming year and how we're going to address them and work together to address them. So um, some of the topics that we discussed, we had uh, presentations by Michael Joyce, who is our student legal counsel, and he uh, updated us on a variety of areas that are pertinent for administrators, which is Chapter 222, which is the discipline law that's now a year old, um, bullying and harassment, um, attendance, 504s, and special education. Um, these are always excellent sessions because we talk about case studies. Some of them we talk about our own situations and how we would address them. Um, and it gives, it gives our administrators that additional knowledge and skills so when we do have a situation in the district, we can address it proactively. We also brought in Colby Brunt, who is our labor counsel, um, to talk about HR legal issues. Um, I also presented to the uh, administrators uh, teacher evaluation process this year. There is a new component added with the common measures and how that will impact the evaluation process and um, how we will use the common measures through our PLCs uh, to improve uh, teaching and learning. We also had a long conversation. As you know, tonight uh, you saw that we had several new team chairs. And so we had long discussions about the roles and responsibilities of team chairs and how that's going to play out at each level in our, in our district. Um, we also talked about the roles and responsibilities of technicians. And the reason why this is an important piece is because what we've seen over time, because we haven't had necessarily the, the help that we've needed, is that our technology integration specialists, which really should be in a coaching role with our teachers with technology integration, sometimes are more involved with the fixing of computers instead of the instructional piece. So with the additional technician that we were able to get through restructuring in our budget this year, um, we, we came up with a list of roles and responsibilities for both areas. Mm -hmm. So now we have clear roles and responsibilities for technology integration specialists and technicians um, and how that's gonna play out. Our technicians are now more building based um, where they're either sharing the two schools that are geographically close together or if it's a bigger school like the high school, we have one technician assigned. And this is hopefully going to improve our, um, our, our break fix system when something goes down and we have a, um, a, a, a quick response. Uh, we also had a long conversation. As you know, we had to cut about $80,000 out of our substitute teacher uh, budget this year um, in, the, in the FY16 budget. And we had a long conversation of what that's going to look like and how are we going to do things differently to address that. So we came up with a series of expectations and agreements. Um, each building has been allocated based on the number of teachers in their building, um, a set number of substitute days uh, that are allocated for professional development, uh, for field trips, for IEP meetings. Um, and so those are for professional development activities that are not associated with a grant. The ones that are associated with a grant, um, those will be funded um, through the grant, such as the school transformation grant when we, we are doing work, say, in MTSS, um, the school transformation grant, we have money budgeted for a substitute. So um, we had a long conversation <coughs> about that so that we're all on the same page uh, so that we can stay within budget. Um, PD and professional development had a lot of conversation about PLCs. Um, and what those are going to look like this year. We're now entering year two of that. And we're very excited about that because uh, the PLCs are now in a really strong place. Uh, we went through certainly some growing pains last year. Um, common measures were being developed last year. But now we feel we're in a really good place 
with our PLCs and what the professional development that's going to go along with it. <laughs> During our retreat, we had a book discussion. Uh, we started a book group discussion on visible learning um, by Dr. Hattie. Um, and actually, I mentioned it today in my opening remarks. And Dr. Hattie uh, did a, a meta-analysis of over 900 uh, research studies and took a look at influences, policies, and other things that would have a, an effect on students and student achievement. And developed this whole spectrum of 132 of these different influences and their effect size. And without getting too technical, um, I would be more than happy to talk about this more at a later date. Uh, what he found in his studies are things that have an effect size of 0.4 or greater are the types of things that you want to have in your school district. 0.4 is the equivalent of one year's growth for a student. Anything below 0.4 is something that is less than one year's growth and is something that probably is not something, it's not a best practice, it's not an influence that you would want to practice on a regular basis in your school district. So we had a lot of conversations about the things that we currently do and the effect sizes that they potentially could have and the things that we currently do that have a negative or less than 0.4 uh, effect size. Um, and so those are some of the, and some of the things that do have a strong effect size, and I, I talked about this today uh, with, with the uh, teachers, um, professional learning communities has a very high effect size. I think it's around 0 0.7, 0 0.74. Um, MTSS, which is, which is those connections that staff and students make, has a very high effect size. Um, so the things that we're doing, we're on the right path, we're on the right track. And so um, that, was, that was a major portion of our retreat. And that book, we're going to continue having that conversation throughout, throughout the year. And then, um, as you know, last year we were developing action plans um, based on the goals that have been established for the district. And so we finalized action plans in five areas. I'm sorry, yeah, six areas, sorry, six areas. Um, the curriculum instruction assessment is actually the first goal, the first district goal. We decided to split it into three separate goals because we felt it was important to go in deeper mm -hmm. into those areas. So that's why you have that one goal that was split into three different action plans. We have one action plan for MTSS, which is goal number two, I believe, no, goal number three, PLC, which is goal number two, and then the communication goal, which is goal number five. Um, so. Those action plans have been finalized and I will be sharing those with you at a, at a, at a later date. So as you can see, there was a lot of work that was going on with the district leadership team um, this summer. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just want to say I, I did get a chance to look through this package, the slides, and I was just really impressed with the, the quality, the um, sort of the database, um, fact that it's you know sort of best year using best in class and it looked like it was a, a really um, high impact valuable couple of days so I appreciate that that's not easy to create um, I have a question about the so the um, department chairs like I'm thinking the high school department chairs is this book Hattie is, is that going to be part of is, does that get rolled into some of the PLC activity with the department chairs or how, how right now we... the discussion is just at our level administrators okay. I do envision at some point that we will start having these conversations uh, with with te the book is actually written for teachers uh -huh. um, it's called visible learning for teachers uh, we felt it was better to have the discussion at our level first mm -hmm. and then start embedding mm -hmm. it into the practices Part of this is going to also be when we're, we're one time a month we're doing walkthroughs with our administrators and we're going to use some of Hattie's work as, as we're going through in the walkthroughs. So we're going to be practicing at our level first and then it's, you know, filter it down to, to, the, to the teaching level. Okay, thank you. Yes. Um, I love that your meetings are not just um, exchanging information, there are learning opportunities that the leadership team is actually reading something together and dissecting it and learning from it. And one of the, the lessons that I was reading about and that I heard you speak about today was in line with the student mapping that you've done in the past and that one of the big impacts is through the student 
teacher relationship, this, the teacher-student relationship, and that hits a real powerful chord with me because in education, whether a child knows specific facts on a test at the end of a unit is less important to me than if they have the motivation to learn more, uh, an interest in the subject, and someone that will nurture their interest and, and work with them if it's not that that's their primary interest, but to help them engage with the subject matter and blossom as people. And I felt that what you, the Hattie discussion really brought it to the core of who the children are and the connections with the teachers and the staff and that it's not just the connections, it's the empowerment of the students. So teachers are looking at what connections they can make with students, but also that students can become their own teachers, not instead of being taught, but because they're motivated to learn more. And I love that element of the discussion that I think, if I'm correct, is going to be shared from the district leadership team to their teachers. And I heard a lot of that this morning at the introduction to the to the teachers where the, there's really a priority on connecting with the students and, and helping them move from where they are and blossom and know that they're not alone and they can make mistakes and that's all part of the learning process and I love that that is reinforced both through these meetings, the district leadership meetings, the introduction to our teachers and that will be ongoing. Thank you. Okay, we can move on to Craig. Okay. So we have several things. It's been a busy summer, actually. The 66 days, is that? Yep, 66 days. <laughs> um, went very fast. The first one up there is math professional development with Mahesh, uh, Professor Mahesh Sharma, um, which was absolutely outstanding. And I hope it's the first of several 2D offerings that we are able to offer. We're looking at even partnering with other districts Probably since I entered the role, this has been one of the most common requests that I've received from staff. We've had opportunity the last couple of years for staff to attend some of his courses. Professor Sharma is a, um, a professor of math at the college level. He's a former um, college president of, of um, uh, Cambridge College um, and really is one of the leading educators in the, not just this area, but around the country, even around the world. Um, and so teachers who have been um, attending some of his workshops in the last couple of years come back absolutely enthusiastic, thrilled, saying we need to send some people in. A and B, is there any way that we can get him involved and ready? So we were thrilled to be able to do that this year and begin a relationship with him. Um, matter of fact, REF, even uh, one of the grants that we received this year is allowing him to come back again in the fall, and we're looking to build upon that. Um, the PD that he's offering, we, we really focused on the elementary level this time, but the goal would be to sort of go K-8 um, in this. But he focuses on the concept of numeracy, which is really the literacy skills of mathematics um, that students really need to form that secure and strong foundation that allows them to easily transition through algebra and higher mathematics later. Um, as Professor Sharma says, um, and he explains this in his, in his teachings, just as we expect a child to read fluently with comprehension by about third grade in elementary school, um, our goal should be to work with every child to make sure they've mastered numeracy by the time they're in fourth grade, so that they can learn mathematics easily, effectively, efficiently, um, just as a fluent reader does. Um, and so that's, that was our goals. He also um, included the impact of disability such as dyslexia and dyscalculia on the learning of math, especially number conceptualization and how that hinders students later on in their study of mathematics. Um, so that was out outstanding. The next one up there is our, the No Adam Silence curric or Science Curriculum Pilot. As you know, our, our science curriculum really has been in need of updates and with the shift in standards that's happening, um, it's, a, it's good timing to do that. Um, we had a group of teachers in one of our PL, in our science PLC last year exploring available curriculum programs. We were reaching out to other science educators, other organizations, other districts that are also in the same process. Um, the No Adam curriculum was getting high marks 
across the board as being very aligned to the new standards. Um, it's a full year STEM curriculum with a real focus on hands-on learning that allows students to learn by feeling what it's like to be a, a scientists and engineers um, and really providing them the necessary resources to master STEM inquiry. Um, Across the board in fifth grade, we'll be piloting this program this year, as well as some additional classrooms in K through four, teachers who are very enthusiastic and volunteering to try it out at their grade levels. Um, again, it has a real focus on higher order thinking skills, real world application, but also does a great job of linking literacy skills to other, and the application to other content areas, to ELA and math and so forth. Um, Make sure I'm not forgetting anything. We were very impressed with the professional development that the program was able to provide also. Um, in addition to helping us implement the next generation science standards, we found that it really was giving teachers the background, both the content and the pedagogy they need to really successfully teach science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, so we felt it's gonna pair really well um, with what we're doing with, with math and also our literacy initiative. So, we hope a little bit later in the year to give you more information on that and sort of give you an update on how that's going. So that's something we'll do a little bit later in the year. Um, the School Reform Initiative Training for Teacher Leaders. As you know, um, we've been, and uh, we have a grant that's supporting this as well. The work we've been doing with Gene Thompson Grove, the School Reform Initiative for our teacher leaders, especially our curriculum leaders. We hosted a five-day facilitative leadership institute which was called Coaching Groups Using the Principles and Practices of Critical Friendship. Um, we had a number of our educators and curriculum leaders participate, as well as several educators from other districts. I think we even had three or four from somewhere in New York State that joined us. Um, and it really provided um, the opportunity for groups of educators to learn how to use SRI principles and practices of critical friendship, facilitative leadership, and adult development um, to commit themselves to learning with and from one another. Um, and again, the feedback that we've gotten from staff who's been a part of these trainings has been outstanding. We feel that's important as we go along. Um, we had a number of our uh, teacher leaders and curriculum leaders, teaching staff, put in hours over the summer, reviewing such things as our curriculum maps, pacing guides, common measures. Our goal was to ensure that as we begin the school year that everyone is on the same page, literally. Um, so people were spending a lot of hours putting, uh, reviewing that work. Our curriculum leaders, especially at the elementary level, um, we're getting together to do some reviews of our elementary report cards. Um, the goal really was to review our entire elementary reporting process to ensure now that everything's well aligned with our new standards, curriculum, um, that we have a consistent and sound vertical progression in the grade levels in that reporting process and really to explore all the other feedback that we've received in the last couple years from from community from staff um, and how can we better communicate student progress to parents and guardians um, so they're going to continue this effort over the next several weeks and we're looking at ways to improve that um, educator induction program uh, dr doherty had mentioned the staff orientation we held that last week over the course of the week, um, we've provided overviews and discussion on a, a range of topics that included our MTSS, educator evaluation, professional learning communities, teacher leadership, special education, classroom management, technology, school safety, inclusion of students with disabilities, and um, all of them also participated in the uh, full youth mental health first aid training. Um, and I just wanna echo what Dr. Doherty said. I mean, they were truly an impressive group. I mean, they really stood out to me. Their professionalism, the way they participated, the way that they engaged with each other. I mean, I think we're really lucky to have them here in our district. Um, mentor training. We also provided a mentor training workshop to approximately 30 of our staff district-wide in order to better equip um, experienced staff members to assist beginning educators um, to our district in the professional responsibilities and our general school or district procedures. The training also provided an overview and support in all of their mentoring responsibilities, you know, meeting weekly with their mentees, um, how best to conduct peer observations in each other's classrooms, providing support in the mass frameworks and the writing curriculum, 
offering guidance on instructional strategies and best practices within different content areas, addressing issues such as classroom management and effective communication with parents, um, and how to recognize and address multiple learning styles and individual student needs within the classroom. You know, I, I want to point out too that sort of consistent with our theme of providing more opportunities for teacher leadership, I should state that um, not only of course are the, the mentors or the potential mentors that are getting trained are of course our own, our own staff and that gives them a leadership opportunity, but the entire mentor training is, was developed and provided by some of our own teacher leaders um, in alignment with the DESC's um, new mentoring and induction guide, guidelines. So it's all really teachers learning and sharing with, with other teachers, which I think was outstanding. Um, speaking to the next one there, the um, three-year program, speaking of the DESC guidelines that were just published last spring, sort of an update of them, I think it was the end of April. Um, those same teacher leaders are also in the process, and they began that this summer, of helping to design a multi-year educator preparation program for new staff to provide educators with the content um, experience and pedagogical skills to really have a positive impact on student learning as they enter the profession, especially those people who are new in their first few years to the profession. Um, there are these the teachers that are looking at how best to design this as well are reaching out to other experienced staff members and mentors in our district um, who can provide modules of this program to new staff, so we offer options and, and things. Um, essentially, the, um, the state, in order to obtain the professional licensure, teachers are required to complete an additional 50 hours of mentoring type of experience beyond their initial um, mentoring experience in their first year. Um, and the state cites you know, that the research really shows that the, 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 out, the clear benefits in teacher effectiveness and retention um, of staff when induction programs extend into the second and third year of a teacher's career. So that's what we're looking to do. We, um, our, our hope and plan is to implement some of that this year. Um, they're in the process of um, finishing up some of those designs. And I think not only does this benefit our new teachers who learn from experienced and effective teacher leaders, and of course our students <coughs> whose learning is impacted in positive ways, um, but also I really think that this will help us increase our ability to retain and um, you know strong staff, both the experienced staff and our newer staff that we want to come to, that we're able to provide this as a district. Um, allergy guidelines. We revised and updated our allergy guidelines for the district in order to provide a safe and supportive learning environment for all students that's really sort of tailored and appropriate to the developmental stage, especially at the elementary level, where you wanted to ensure a more consistent experience across all five schools. Um, it's been a number of years, I think about eight or nine, mm -hmm. since our allergy guidelines have, have been updated. Yeah. And so it was definitely time to do so. Um, and principals are going to be communicating um, that to staff and families in the next few days. Um, and lastly on there, the District Curriculum Accommodation Plan, or the DCAP as we call it. This summer we completed a revision of our DCAP. Um, it's a general education document that's for our entire district that really summarizes our plan to ensure that all students are able to access the curriculum. Um, and I actually think that's a great transition point that I can hand it over to Carolyn to sort of continue discussing DCAP and its role in student services. Questions first, yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I would echo everything you said about Dr. Sharma. Yeah. Um, what is our actual relationship with him? Did we end up like getting seats at his professional development? So we are contracting with him <coughs> to bring to bring him in. Oh, you, um, okay. That's yeah. What I thought so I we're hosting it. his workshops, and that's what we're thinking we're of looking at okay. piloting or um, partnering with some other districts to offer them some seats as when well, and share some of that happen? expense if we want to move forward with them. Will that happen in the summer during the school year? Both. 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 Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then peer observations. You talked about mentoring. Mm -hmm. Did do the, they actually leave the classroom and go in and, and do an observation? Yep. That, that's one of the uh, expectations of the mentor-mentee relationship that they plan times to observe each other's classrooms and have discussions about that. How often do they get to do that? Minimum of three. Yeah, I think I think um, the requirement is three. I believe. Minimum of three. Yes. But sometimes it's happening happening more informally. And then um, lastly, you mentioned curriculum maps and, and curriculum uh, curriculums were reviewed. 
Were all curriculums reviewed, or did you? Not all of them. Um, I mean, there's some done across the board. Um, uh, math, both elementary and middle. Um, some in pockets, some in uh, ELA and elementary. Our goal, and I don't know how quickly it's going to happen, our goal is to make sure that we have all the documents and then to get them published online. We're looking at ways through our Atlas program and stuff to make sure that all that is easily accessible to the community. So we wanted to get all of these documents polished up. So, And our curriculum leaders are able now to do that work. And we'll be presenting it um, at their first PLC meetings to make sure that if there's any questions or input and then we can move forward from there. So at some point or another though, I would assume all curriculum areas would have that opportunity? Yes. Yep. Okay. Yep. And there, was there a timeline, a time, time frame on that? Is that going to happen for two years? I don't, have, I don't have a specific timeline. That's something that I want the curriculum leaders now with their PLCs that when they get together we're going to be um, determining very specific goals and objectives for this year and then we'll be able to publish those. Thanks. Yep. Thank you. Yes. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Craig, can I ask a question about the science frameworks for the state? Mm -hmm. What's the timeline on when the new frameworks go into effect, and when will the MCAS be aligned to them? Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think. I think they're January. Yeah, this uh, late fall or early winter. January. They're going to be voting mm -hmm. on the uh, the framework, the new standards for the science. So we should be hearing about that. Um, I don't recall off the top of my head what they're talking about in terms of the newest state assessments, um, but I think once they've adopted the uh, the new standards and adopted the new curriculum framework, then they'll move pretty quickly for the new assessments. Um, the, the, the program that we're piloting right now is sort of straddling both. Um, they are aligned with the next generation science standards. Um, while also including, because there are some things that they're, and they're, they have a lot of connections with the, the people in Massachusetts, so there are some things that they haven't taken out yet um, to make sure that they're kind of doing both, but they're anticipating in the next, next several months that they'll even be refining some of their um, standards. So presumably we won't make any formal decision on any curriculum until those frameworks are right. finalized. Right. Okay. Thank you. Excuse I'm me. I'm sorry. Uh, can, can she let us finish? Yeah. Should, should I yeah. repeat? She, yeah. Can I repeat oh. it? Yeah. Um, I asked uh, Mr. Martin when the state would be implementing the new science curriculum and when the MCAS, science MCAS, would be aligned to that. And he <coughs> indicated, and jump in if I get it wrong, this is a test of my listening, um, mid-year this year, late fall, early winter this year would be the new. I think um, by January. January. By January, the new curriculum. And then the MCAS at some point pretty quickly upon that. And I followed up with the question that we wouldn't make a decision on any curriculum purchase until those frameworks were um, determined, and he said that absolutely yeah. was the case. Yeah. And I'll speak up. I apologize. Well, I, I should state, too, that there are some other districts that are, I, I think I said this, that are also in the same position we are, and several have already made commitments to be transitioning to this program because it's getting such high marks across the board. Um, you know, so right now we decided to pilot with one grade level and other teachers that really wanted to be a part of this so that we have some information. I also thought just in terms, there's so much going on um, with new programs, to have a core group of people that have been wanting to do this, they're positive, get some experience and expertise in how this works to share as we move mm -hmm. and start adopting, if that's the direction we go with other grade levels, that will make the rollout much uh, more efficient, I think, and, and a little bit easier. Well. Um, yeah, so I'll just start off. I just want to comment on the no Adam. And um, probably two years ago, I had an opportunity to work with the, the uh, guy who's the CEO of no Adam. He has great relationships in the de um, Department of Elementary, Secondary Ed. He is extremely knowledgeable of the frameworks, um, very energetic. I got to know him be uh, uh, working with uh, him and also the assistant, you know, the the director for curriculum and instruction at Manchester Essex, where Trisha Belusi went to. But they approached us, and um, I had the opportunity to give a tour as part of the professional development for the teachers for No Adam. They came to our manufacturing facility to spend a day to see, you know, what is manufacturing, what is engineering really like? What do you do? How do you do it? The teachers were so excited about, well, the opportunity to come there and, and see it sort of for real. But they were really, I was, of course, asking them lots of questions about this curriculum and, you know, what do you really think? 
and they were all like really very excited about it. I know at the time, I think we had one teacher from Reading who was sort of signed up, um, but maybe I don't know if she made didn't make the tour. So I'm really excited to see you I, guys pursuing I should, this. I should say, since you met him, the, the founder and CEO provided the PD to our teachers. Oh, that's right. great. Um, the other day. Yeah, so, yeah, that's excellent. Last week. Um, I have two other, just quick. So the mentors, can I ask, the, the mentors are, is that voluntary? So the teachers who are mentors, that's voluntary? No, they get a stipend. No. Well, they do get a stipend, but they volunteer for the role. They, they volunteer yeah. for the role. Right. OK, yeah. but they get a stipend. Yes. But they don't yes. have to do it. That's no. They choose to do it, yeah. and they get a stipend. OK, so I want to clarify. And I guess I just saw on the curriculum mapping, I think going down Gary's line of questioning, really feel like it, it, that the high school, um, ninth and 10th grade, really needs to be done if it wasn't done uh, with the, in regard to doing that. Maybe it was done last year, I'm not sure, but if it, you know, I think that needs to be a priority for, uh, for us. Craig, on the uh, elementary report card review, is there gonna be a final report from that, or? Yeah, so, so they're going to be suggesting changes to us. I mean, right now, the feedback that we received from both staff and community was pretty overwhelmingly positive about the way they, we did the um, conferencing at the first term. We decided um, at the end of last year that overall our input, both from staff and from parents as well, is that the, the um, interim time before the next or the first formal report seemed a little long, so we're going to move that up. Um, to like mid-year sort of you know at the beginning of February instead of like the end of March to make sure that we sort of have some even times in between um, but they are looking at a way to sort of streamline and um, what are the best ways to communicate I still think there's a lot of confusion with um, the parent community um, you know so that's what they're looking at um, so so there's no movement to go back to Regular grades. Yeah, regular you know. grades. I mean, I think the standards based is the way to go, but I think um, where we're at now is to make sure that we all understand how to do that well, even from the teacher's standpoint, and you know, are we all using sort of the same criteria to, to um, determine that and how, and how best to communicate that to parents and guardians. You know, right now it's, it's a, some, in some areas it's a pretty long list, and what does that mean, mm -hmm. and do we need to consolidate some things, so they're, they're looking at that. And we thought that the curriculum leaders who are doing that curriculum work and looking at student progress and you know student data with their PLCs would be best to be the liaisons and then to be that link to um, reviewing and revising, if necessary, the report cards. So. Thank you. Yes. Um, I would echo, again, uh, Craig's thought on it's very challenging for I think parents to look at a standards-based report card mm -hmm. and before we get what's happening, it's hard for the teachers to really convey it so that they can understand it. And I almost think that it might be really worthwhile having a, a presentation, open it up to parents mm -hmm. to explain it, and, and um, maybe videotape it, and keep it online or something. Oh, cool. um, the other thing, too, I would add is that um, most districts, I don't think we're doing that, but our music, physical education have national and state standards. And currently, I think that those curriculum areas are minimized because they're not uh, going, they're not grading students on their right, standards. Right. Well, that's the other reason, too. I think I've, I caught what you're saying that the uh, curriculum leaders, because we'll be including those curriculum leaders, the, the specialists as well, to make sure that they are a full part of those discussions. And, and I think that will help yeah. them in terms of com uh, common measures, too. Yep. Yep, so. I agree. Great. Yes. I just quickly wanted to say that I really like the process that we use in terms of engaging the teachers. It's not a top-down dictation as to what curriculum we are going to use. It's um, the teachers are very involved in choosing and experimenting and talking to other people about the curriculum that we're going to choose. And then they own it in the end. And uh, Dr. Doherty promised today, this morning, about no more mandates and, and dictated um, initiatives coming down. And this is a way, and you use the, the term, uh, increasing capacity so that teachers are involved and they make it easier for themselves by working together to choose these and to work on the report cards so that they own that communication method with the parents about the children. So I just 
I like that well, the teachers are so involved in this process. It's consistent. I remember, what was it now, over a year ago when Secretary Duncan and the, um, Commissioner Chester came and we had the community forum. You know, and even from our teachers, you know, we, we express the sentiment that it's not that we disagree with some of the direction that we are going in education, but with so much happening overall, educators are feeling as if it, things are being done to them instead of with them. And we felt it was very important to empower teachers in this process because we have incredible expertise in our staff and we have to harness that and that's what we've been trying to do. Thank you. You know that saying, those that teach can, those that can't teach make laws about teaching. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right, so I'm going to give a little update of what was happening in my office um, this summer. Um, first and foremost, which isn't on here, which I for shouldn't have forgotten about, is that we ran an extended school year program oh, yeah. for our students with special education needs who require services over the summer to prevent substantial regression. This was a six-week program that started after the 4th of July and ran until August 13th. Um, we had students at Wood End, we had students here at Coolidge, and we had students at the high school. Kelly Vicato is one of our special education teachers whose job it is to coordinate that program, and she does a phenomenal job in terms of organizing schedules and making sure that all the services are provided and making sure we have the right amount of staff there and um, also triaging any issues that might come up with transportation or facilities or anything else. So that was a big part of the summer that we didn't list on here. Um, in terms of the curriculum accommodation plan, this work was led by Heather Leonard, the principal at Barrows, so I don't want to take credit for this. She did a lot of work last year with a team of teachers and administrators to develop this document. And we're excited to roll this out because it's a way for us to share with staff some tools for their toolbox. So a curriculum accommodation plan says, okay, I have a student in my classroom who's struggling and I don't know what to do, let me pull this out. And it is organized in a fashion that it says, okay, I have a student who's struggling with the organization and it gives you some ideas of things you could do with that student. And it really ties in with our MTSS work and our tier one support. So yesterday, today and tomorrow, I am kind of presenting it initially to staff and then principals will be do doing more work and rolling it out. We'll also be posting it on our website so that the public can see this plan. Um, it's always a work in progress and it's always something that we're updating. Um, another big focus for me this summer has been the post program for our 18 to 22 population, so I've been doing a lot of work um, with Wakefield, and they ran into a glitch with their um, site, so there's going to be a delay to the site they had identified until around January, so we worked together to locate a um, space here at the Reading Memorial High School, and the students in the post program will be coming to Reading High School um, through January, and then when the renovation is completed, they will move, be moving to the new space. I've been spending a lot of time with the families. We're hosting an open house on Wednesday so that families from both Reading and Wakefield can come and see the space and meet the teachers. And uh, so we're really excited. Most of the families are very excited about what the program is going to offer in terms of the community-based experiences and the opportunities to have internships and recreation. So they're very excited about that. Everyone has a little bit of angst because it's something new. Um, another piece that I did this summer is we had Alan Bloom, who is a retired professor from Simmons College. He had done some work with our special education staff during the school year. Um, last week he came in to work with our team chairs, as well as team chairs from Wakefield and Winthrop. And we worked together on how to write a more linear data-based IEP. And this was great work for all of our team chairs and, uh, and um, they seem to really enjoy also meeting other team chairs in the area. Um, our team chairs, as Dr. Doherty mentioned, they participated in our administrative leadership meetings, which was the first time that that has happened for them. And I think it was a very exciting opportunity for them to hear kind of the same message that all administrators are and how to build their role and their capacity as administrators in our district. Um, throughout the summer, 
the different buildings were doing MTSS work. So at each building, the teams came together to do planning and preparation for this coming year. And then the district-wide MTSS team met last week with Sarah Bird. They spent a whole day together kind of developing some goals for um, this coming year. And we also included our new um, BCBA, Lisa Studer, on that team, which is, she's a very great addition to that team. Uh, mental health first aid trainings were also offered this summer, including with our new teaching staff. We've also outlined some dates for the upcoming school year for that to happen. Um, I think about two weeks ago, uh, we sent a team of staff, about eight staff, to a behavioral health conference that was sponsored by both SEAM and North Shore Education Consortium. We're members of both of those collaboratives. This was a phenomenal two-day conference. It was held at Essex Aggie, and there were a number of different strands. I spent the two days um, in a suicide prevention strand. Um, we got to see Dr. Robert Brooks speak. Some of our staff attended some trainings on sort of social and emotional supports. There were also strands on, um, I'm trying to think of some of the other ones. It was ones on leadership, and Sarah Bird actually presented on the development of MTSS teams to other administrators in the area. It was a great two days and very well run at Essex Aggie. Um, and then, as I said, today and tomorrow, my days are filled with mandatory employee training. So I am visiting every school, sometimes combined with Michelle Saunders, and we're completing the mandated training, going over harassment, discrimination, bullying, civil rights requirements, we're talking about restraint, um, some suicide prevention, going over special education. It's about an hour long training that we do with each group um, to really make sure it's a good refresher on some of the requirements and especially around the new restraint regulations. Um, and then during our administrative council times, we reviewed the Walker <coughs> report and as an administrative team, we developed some priorities, and we'll be sharing that out with you in September. We have the final report, and so we'll be sharing that at a meeting coming up very soon. So, and then the other piece is the um, ELL. So we need to add a teacher for English language learners. The Department of Education has put out some new guidelines for us, which has resulted in our students needing more hours. So we already were in a deficit based on our last coordinated program review and the number of students who've moved to our community um, who qualify for this service. And now we have new guidance that actually increases the hours, especially for our new um, students who are new to the English language. Similar to special education and preschool, it's about early intervention. It's about working with these ELL students early, often, and getting that language acquisition in. So we just don't have the staffing with 1.5 FTE um, teaching staff to service our nine schools in our preschool and to do the amount of evaluation and monitoring and direct instruction that we need. So that is. Um, we are in the process right now of looking to hire um, a 1.0. And then additionally, I also work, I am working on putting together a professional development plan for our special education staff for the school year. So using our grant funds as well as our operating budget to put together a plan with a focus on bringing people here to Reading to provide more of that coaching model so that we are giving our staff in the moment training versus sending them to a one-shot workshop. So we are finalizing a couple opportunities that I'll be reporting out in September once we finalize our grants and, and contracts. So. I just have a question. So on the post program, where is that going in the high school that we actually have room for something? <laughs> so, <laughs> well, we, we do and we don't. Um, when we, and we only found out about this recently that Wakefield's facility was not going to be ready. And uh, when we talk about the IMA in a little bit, I, we can go in a little bit more detail. But uh, the temporary placement is there is a faculty dining room close to the cafeteria, which is not really used. Um, it's used, there's coffee machines in there, there's a vending machine in there, but it is not really used. 
by staff. Most staff eat their lunches in their department areas. Um, each department has their own space. Um, so it, it, it's an underutilized space. And so we're going to, for six months, use it for this program. Yeah, yeah and what's great about it is it has a sink, it has a refrigerator, it has a microwave. Mm -hmm. It also has easy access outside, and we're going to be right. dedicating a parking spot for the van, so it'll be easy for them to get in and out and be in the community with mm -hmm. activities. They're also looking to set up um, a coffee center and do some coffee and <coughs> tea in that program, so we'll get that with their staff. Mm -hmm. Is save the teachers from sorry getting the training of the coffee. Is the team is the team chair leadership training new this year or is that I mean I know it's a very difficult position but it seems like every year we have new team chairs. So uh, it, and I'd like to see that you know some more longevity. Yes, we would too. Um, and that is one of the things in the Walker report that we were there was a finding on. And so Carolyn has done a great job this year um, through the hiring process, um, finding, finding strong people, and now making them part of our leadership team and having dedicated spaces at each of the buildings for them. Um, I, I believe, in my opinion, I've said this many times, they really are an assistant principal for special education. And so they are administrators. And so in order to, to have them here for a while, we need to nurture them, build their capacity, and train them um, in a variety of ways. And so this is, what we're doing is we're building their capacity, so yes. I've also given to them a mentor to try to help, again, similar to, to our teachers, so a little bit different in terms of the requirement, but they each have a mentor to help support them in learning how we do things in Reading and just kind of coaching them through some challenging situations. What? Thank you. So I just wanted to be a little more clear on the um, ELL. So when we had the previously the coordinated program review, it was sort of a, a finding that there was this was an issue area, and then you're saying the state has changed some standards or expectations since we created the budget. Um, yeah. So there's a whole history with ELL in the state, and I don't know if you are aware of what's going on, but the Department of Justice a couple of years ago came into the state and said that we were not. Uh, providing adequate services and training our staff appropriately to work with English language learner students. This is the whole state, not just not right. So ELL has been under a microscope in our commonwealth now for two years, which is why now every educator needs to get sheltered English immersion training, uh, every administrator and teacher. If they currently have a student in their class, they are required to, what you heard this evening, one of our teachers was at a training this evening. If, the, if the, there is a student in their class that's um, ELL, they need to attend a 12 session training uh, following department the Department of Education standards. So that's one piece of this. The other piece to this is the amount of service time uh, needs to be provided to students. And so in the coordinated program review, they have been uh, very strict in that over the last few years. And this is one area, we, we had very, very few areas uh, that we needed to address in our coordinated program review across the board except for ELL. And we have keep, we've kept submitting reports to them on what we've tried to do with ELL. And the bottom line is that they came back to us and said, you have to hire more staff. You, you don't have a choice. Um, so uh, we feel that with a 1.0 teacher, um, we'll, we'll be able to adequately address this. Right. So uh, I, I, I sort of believe that we already sort of drew blood from the stone when we did the budget. I know that there's been a lot of creativity um, with, with trying to make sure that we could um, offer the programs we wanted. I'm a little bit more familiar with some of the things at the high school, you know, honor Spanish, the number of engineering classes, um, you know, to, to make sure that we weren't turning away 30 students um, and they weren't going home, you know, saying I didn't get the classes I wanted because we can't afford it as a district. So. Whatever, it would seem to me that we would have to be going to the finance committee to say this is an additional requirement. I, I don't know how we get through this. And I, I know that I look out on the crowd that we had in here today and there's a bit of angst about the next six months and, and where that brings us. So in terms of being able to support them, great energetic teachers joining the district and we want them to be here. 
for many years to come. So I don't know, Chairman Robinson, maybe it's more for us to discuss, but it would seem to me like this is a requirement that we can't be expected to be pulling the funding out of somewhere else for this FTE. Well, we can provide it in a timely manner anyways, instead of telling us in June or July that we need to do it. The, the Desi telling us, you know, right. it'll be No, I understand. We get the results of the coordinated re program review in February? February. February, and we keep submitting, we've been, we've been consistently said, submitting progress reports to them explaining how we were going to address this. And they kept coming back saying, you've got to try again, you've got to come up with something better. And finally they just said, you need to have additional staffing. You cannot do this with the staffing that you currently have. Yeah, I understand, it's just to me it's like, as, as Elaine said, the, the, the expectation that we're just gonna pull, you know, whatever amount of money we need, 60, 70,000 dollars or more, and uh, provide that funding, it's, it's hard to do that. And, you know, it would have been, I, I don't know, I'm just frustrated that they couldn't have said, you can't do it, you know, obviously it can't happen this year, it's gonna have to be part of your budget for 2017, but I well, guess that's they, not the they, they can claim it's a violation of the child's civil rights. Yeah. And so, it, it, this is, and, and this is similar to special education services, in a lot of ways, um, that we're required to provide this. So, oh, I, to, I, to your yeah. point, Mrs. Webb, I, I think what we need to do is we need to see how, what happens over the next few uh, couple months with the budget, see where we are, and then with make, the special education make a specifically, make with a determination education. if we if we need to uh, address uh, this okay. with funding. Okay, because because this is the example of you did we did everything we could to be creative, right. mm -hmm. and in in many cases right. we're in control over the execution of that creative uh, solution, and in this case we're not because the state is coming back saying. We don't care how creative you are, it's not enough and you need this yeah. FTE. Well, okay. well, well, let's see how it yeah. Yeah, plays out. Yeah. We'll, okay. We will definitely come back to you with an update at a later date on this budget. You asked my question. Um, I sort of have a, oh. Sure. I sort of have a piggyback question about, it sounds like there was a lot of professional development going on this summer, which I'm ecstatic about. Um, because it means there's a lot of professional development going without needing substitute teachers, without mm -hmm. taking teachers out of the classroom, which I think is great. Um, my question is, again, relating to the budget, where are we at in terms of our PD budget? And um, you also mentioned the 12-session training if there are students with English as a second language. Um, I'm assuming there's a cost associated? Are, right now they are free, and they're done in outside and, and, and the teachers the teachers aren't compensated for attending it. oh and we're hosting it. it's a licensure requirement for teachers yeah. and administrators they not have to attend it to keep their licensure so this is coming from the state not from us. Uh, we anticipate doing a, a budget update probably in early November once we get through October the first few tables um, as mentioned tonight you know we onboarded almost 75 people that will hit our payroll on September 11th, so we'll, we'll have some visibility to the first few payrolls to see where we're at, and we can keep a spreadsheet that kind of keeps track of, you know, an M30 left and replace it, you know, not an M30, um, uh, a master's plus 30, and step 13 left and replace it with an M master's step five. So we, we have some gains and losses every year when we have turnover. Um, as evident tonight, we did hire a lot of senior staff, but we also hired some, some younger staff too, and so, um, we'll have a thoughtful analysis of where we're at in terms of um, overall savings. But um, and as I said, we'll, we'll have an update for you in early November when, once we get through October. The other. Linda, if I can add, uh, to answer your question a little bit more. So we're very creative with the, Craig is very creative with the PD funding. It doesn't come, a lot of it doesn't come out of the operating budget. We'll use uh, Title IIA funding, which is, which is federal amount of money that we get every year. The school transformation grant, we use some of that. Carolyn has a special education PD grant, which also is, comes from the state. So we use pockets of those funds to address <coughs> a lot of the summer PD. Um, we, don't, we don't have a lot of operating funds dedicated to PD anymore because remember, we, we restructured that for the coaches. Yeah. So a lot of the funding for this came from grants and other sources. My additional question is the teachers that are spending time during the summer to do this PD, 
is this part of their professional um, vitae so they don't get stipend for participating or did they get paid for participating in the professional development depending on what it is whether it's working on the report cards or on the decap or you know things that they come in to do for to make our district better are they receiving a stipend or and it was a combination this summer. There are some of the things that um, people were compensated at the hourly contractual rate, but there are also a number of other trainings that um, are optional and they're receiving PD, professional development points and so forth. Uh, so that was their choice to attend. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that question. Thank you. Okay. As you can see, a lot's been going on. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we've got a few other things that uh, that didn't really fit into any other category, so that I that I feel is important. First of all, I don't know if you saw it recently in the newspaper. Uh, Birch Meadow has been recognized by the National PTO Association for their Read Across America program. Um, uh, Patty Beckman sent me the, the link to the article th this morning, so I just want to give uh, kudos to the Birch Meadow um, staff and PTO. Uh, for this recognition. They have a very strong Read Across America program that they've done for several years and now they're, they're nationally recognized for that. Um, we've had some technology upgrades this summer too, which has uh, uh, also been very important. Uh, here at Coolidge, Parker, and at the high school, um, as you remember, uh, we did move some funding last year um, to be able to do a complete wireless infrastructure upgrade at the three schools, um, which will increase our capacity because we have a heavy uh, use of devices at, at these three schools. Um, and that was completed uh, last week. Um, so it is going to improve um, the speed, the connectivity of, of all of the devices that we have. In addition, um, I'm happy to say that all of our XP machines have been replaced in the district. Uh, last year we had about 80 XP machines still wow. in the district. They have now all been replaced um, we were able to use some end of the year funding to be able to finish that off. So we did have a lot of computer replacement this summer um, for both teachers and students. So that, that was also a big, a big uh, help. Um, some other things that are going on uh, starting on Wednesday. Uh, if you've ever been behind near our office, the Rise Preschool, <coughs> at 8.30 in the morning or 11 o'clock, in the morning or at 2.30 in the afternoon, you notice that there was a lot of cars parked, uh, probably illegally, um, up and down the curbs, all up and down the, the driveway. Uh, it's been very concerning for several years. It is a safety issue, and it's a disaster waiting to happen. This year we are going to change um, in the drop-off and pick-up procedure. Um, uh, the parking lot that is directly behind our office, um, that smaller parking lot, which is 33 spaces, is now going to become solely drop off and pick up parking. Um, staff, that was staff parking. We're moving the staff parking down to the field house. Signs have been installed along the curb for, for RISE staff and food service staff and some high school teachers parked there as well to be parking down at the field house area. Um, so the first two rows closest to the, the baseball field um, in the field house uh, parking lot are now going to be for staff. The back two closest to the field house itself are going to be for students. Um, and our hope is, is that we will be able to um, eliminate or at least lessen the amount of illegal parking that's going on so that emergency vehicles can get through easily, food service trucks can get through easily with the delivery trucks which has been an issue as well. Um, so this is a change for safety purposes. Um, I've been in contact with our school resource officer and safety officer, uh, high school principal and uh, RISE uh, director. So we're all on the same page. This has been communicated out. So it's a culture change, but we're gonna give it a shot and see. In, in, the, um, in the spirit of safety, how about we talk about opening the gate? Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. <laughs> well, we can, we can look at that too. One, one, can we one, look, can we one look hard? Thing at a time. <laughs> it, 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 
it is, it is a huge safety issue in that part. I, I met last year with the police chief uh, about that very issue. So I, I can certainly talk to you about that at a later date. Um, so you said that you, the high school principal is on board with this change, so I assume he, they'll communicate appropriate information to the high school kids who are driving to yes. school about yes. where to park and yes. not park. And, okay, great. <laughs> Maybe they'll all get to school early. Maybe they will. <laughs> uh, we've also made a change in our supervision uh, at, at the elementary schools. Um, last year, uh, we, because of our extended day programs, we had, we had supervision from 8 o'clock. Um, our, doors, our doors were secured from 8 o'clock until 6 o'clock at night. Uh, with extended day staffing providing um, the, uh, the door uh, supervision uh, after 3.30 when the secretaries left. Uh, we are also going to extend that now from 7 to 8 in the morning uh, so that anyone that is an extended day uh, parent or a staff member will have to go through a single point of entry where they will be buzzing in um, like they do any other time during the during the day. So that is a change, and again, for safety purposes and security purposes at our, at our elementary schools. Um, the other thing that, uh, a couple other things. One is, uh, in the past we've done presentations to the school committee by school. Um, what we're gonna do this year, because we feel it, it will give you more information uh, than what you've seen in the past, is that we are going to be presenting to you by topic. So we're gonna be giving you, uh, at a future date, a whole calendar of topics um, and who is going to be the lead on those topics um, for the entire school year. We've been working on that. Um, that doesn't mean that's the only thing that's gonna be happening at those meetings, but these are topics, some of them you heard about this evening, um, that we're going to go into much more detail with you at specific meetings, like the water reports coming up um, in, in September. I will be doing my presentation on the community forums um, in September. So those types of things are gonna be done um, as specific topics instead of doing it by school. And so it avoids duplication of mm -hmm. some topics that you saw last year. We right. feel this is a much better way to get you the information in, in a more timely and informative manner. So I'll be sharing that with you at our next meeting. And then, um, the last piece on this slide that I want to tell you is October 5th through 7th, the National School Public Relations Association is going to be coming in to do a communications audit. This is part of goal five, I believe, of the goals that um, we've been working on as a district. Uh, we went out to bid last year for uh, the services of several um, groups, and they clearly provided the, the, the report that we feel is going to be best informative to help us move forward with a communication, a district communication plan. So as part of that, they are gonna be coming to a school committee meeting and they're gonna be asking you a series of questions. Um, they're also gonna be doing nine other focus group sessions. Some are gonna be community-based, some are gonna be school-based, um, and we will be communicating that out in the near future for people that wanna participate. Um, so that's October 5th through 7th. I know we're throwing a lot at you, but we felt that it was important. The last piece I want to share with you, because um, you saw a lot of people here tonight, and you saw a lot of names on the, the paper in your packets, I want to talk a little bit about staffing and how did we get to the place that we were uh, this evening with so many hires. Uh, so we had a, a total of 45 teachers that have been hired in the district for this year. Uh, 18 of those 45 were retirements. That is by far the largest number of retirements that we've had in several years. Wow. Usually we're averaging three to five retirements a year. Um, we also had 17 resignations, and I'll talk a little bit more about resignations in a second. We had six non-renewals. Those renewals were for both performance reasons and when we were restructuring some of the positions that we did during the budget process, um, a, a teacher may have been non-renewed. And in four, uh, the last one, we had four transfers within the district to non-teaching positions, administrative positions or coaching positions. Again, that is unique. 
It's an anomaly. We usually don't have um, that makes sense. I think it's a good thing. We're promoting from within. Mm -hmm. um, but Rang Memorial High School assistant principal, Rang Memorial High School team chair, the literacy coach, and the first Birch Meadow associate principal were all teachers last year. That required us to fill their positions. So when you take a look at the 18 retirements and the six non renewals and the four transfers, that's 28 positions that were for reasons other than resignations, which I think is significant when people are asking the question, why did you have 45 teachers that you had to hire this year? A very large chunk of them were for those reasons. Now, if you move over to the resignations, and we've been doing exit data survey, which I think is important, and it'll, it, when I do my report to you in a couple weeks, I'm gonna go into more detail on that exit data survey. Um, but here are some of the major reasons for resignations. Uh, shorter commute to a new position. Uh, we had a teacher, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Sprung talked about a teacher that was, uh, that they had to hire a teacher in August. The teacher got a position literally across the street from, her, from the school that she was gonna work in. A much shorter commute, it's usually a 45 minute drive to Reading, and now she has to walk across the street to her new job. And it was a comparable sal salary. Um, we had several teachers that uh, resigned because they are staying home to raise their family. Um, we had a few teachers that left the district for an advancement in career uh, to, to other school districts, whether it be to a director's level or to uh, an administrator's level, uh, but we had some teachers that, that left for those reasons. We did have some teachers, and it was um, six is the number that um, I calculated that left and they got a significant increase in pay. Or it was the workload and most of those teachers for the workload were special education teachers. And that is something that we are working on, Carolyn is very aware of. Um, and it was quite evident also in the Walker report that came up. And then we also had some teachers that are relocating out of state. Um, and that was also a, a, a group of teachers. So I, I, wanted, I wanted the committee to understand where did this 45 teachers come from and why were we hiring so many this year? We're usually hiring around 30 a year, 25 to 30. It's been the norm for the last few years. But these are the reasons, when I, when I drilled down deeper to look at the data, these, these are really, this is how it broke down. So I just wanted the committee to, and the community to, to understand that. Yes. Can I just ask, um, and I don't know if you have this off the top of your head, but the teachers who resigned because of pay, were they in a particular place on the pay scale? Was it more zero to five, five to 10 years, or was it all over? Um, it was more veteran teachers. More veteran teachers. Yeah, more veteran. Thank you. Yes. Um, do we ha currently have any outstanding recs? Are there any teachers that we still need, you know, positions that we still need to fill? Or are we fully staffed to start the school? I believe we have a couple of part-time positions that we still have not filled. That's my understanding. Will we get a breakdown of the percentage or the number of students, uh, students, teachers that left for various reasons like? Um, I'm gonna, uh, like when, you I, said, when, six. I, when I do my full report, I will give you much more detail okay. from here. Thanks. But I wanted, I wanted to break it down for you this evening where we, we did introduce to you so many teachers, I wanted you to see, you know, this is, <coughs> this is the breakdown. That, I know that was a long report. Oh, yeah, just a quick. So, is there anything different about um, uh, what retirees can do or not do in the state that that would explain that number? I mean, did they change um, the rules of the game for after you retire, or did? Or out did of those, eight, no, no. Uh, out of those eighteen retirements, actually, we had a few people that retired because they were ill. Um, so I would say we had five five teachers last year um, that was significantly ill and retired for those reasons mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, out of that 18. Okay, thank you. But no, um, I, I think we just had a lot of teachers in this age group that came mm -hmm. in at the same time mm -hmm. and are now leaving at the same time. Okay. But no, no rules have changed on, for, on retirement. Change the other way, actually. Okay. <coughs> okay, that's, uh, that's the, yeah. <laughs> I think that's enough. <laughs> Carl, I won't put you on this. Do, do, do you have any? You don't have to have a report, but if you had uh, one, I'd want I want to give you. I have a question. 
Sure. What's going on in the, uh, the staff parking lot at the <laughs> high school? <laughs> the uh, staff parking lot, parking. all the construction. The, the, the up near the that, performing that. arts center? Yeah. It, it's completed. We rebuilt that retaining wall, that section of the retaining wall. Right. So it's been reopened. So the fencing came down on Friday. They repaved last week. They'll be in one day this week just to do some spot um, patching where some of their screening equipment damaged the pavement, but otherwise they're they're all done. It's been painted and the wall together. was collapsing oh, and it's okay. been repaired. Th I think we should all learn the word carpool though. <laughs> yeah. Carpooling might be a good strategy for students driving to school this year. <laughs> We will uh, go into the uh, second reading of policy GCCD domestic violence and leave. Did you, uh, did anyone submit any requested language changes to that? No. Okay. Mr. Chair, move to approve and accept the second reading of policy GCCD domestic <coughs> violence leave. Um, policy GCCD, domestic violence leave policy. It shall be the policy of the Reading Public School well, District. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to recommend that we dispense with the reading of the uh, policy. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll uh, vote on the policy. All those in uh, favor of the policy? Zero. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, move to approve and accept the second reading of policy JKAA, physical restraint of students. Is there a second? Second. Reading. Uh, policy JKAA, physical restraint of students, restraint prevention and behavior support policy and procedures based on 603. Rock. I propose that we dispense with the reading of this policy. Second. 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 All those in favor? Six zero. All those in favor of the policy? Six zero. Thank you. So we've already, sorry, the uh, post program update. Did we already get that? Or? So um, at the last meeting, you gave me the authority to enter into an agreement. I felt it was important for you to see the agreement and for the committee to vote on it. Um, there has been a lot of back and forth going on between the town of Wakefield and the town of Reading on this agreement, and I felt uncomfortable just unilaterally moving forward with it. Um, the, the, the agreement is fine now. It has been vetted out by both legal counsels of Wakefield and Reading. Um, I want to I want to thank our town manager for getting involved in this. Uh, uh, there was it, it, as late as a week ago, um, I didn't know if this program was going to exist. Um, but uh, both the town managers of Wakefield and the town managers of Reading had some long discussions, uh, making sure that the costs were kept um, at the level that we budgeted for for uh, this year, mm -hmm. which was one hundred fifty thousand dollars. Um, and that is reflected in this agreement. Part of the reason why it's at that level also is because for six months the program is in Reading. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I do recommend that the committee approve this agreement as is. It has been it has been approved by the Wakefield School Committee, and I believe the Board of Selectmen at Wakefield have approved it. Tomorrow night, the Reading Board of Selectmen are going to vote on this. Did we present a fair vote, sir? Certainly. We did not. Wakefield did. Okay. Oh, yes. One more question. How many students are, are enrolled in the program for this coming year? We currently have four, potentially five students, and Wakefield has seven. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, I'd actually like to start by commending Dr. Doherty. I appreciate that you brought it back to the committee. I think that was very appropriate. Um, I have two questions about the agreement. 
one is the termination is 60 days on either side. And could you, I'm a little bit uncomfortable about that, what happens if Wakefield comes back? It says we're, we're terminating this, you have two months to get your students out of this. How, how did you get comfortable with 60 days being adequate? The, the 60 days is for the end of a year. So the program would continue for the rest of the year. It would give us time to, okay, then it's I to give us 60 days notice if the program is not gonna continue the following year. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you very much, that's very reassuring. Um, it also, the only other question I had was, um, it looked like a change is the $2,500 per pupil um, charge for yes. the construction. That wasn't in what was originally presented to no. us, I don't believe. Um, so, so why should <coughs> the town of Reading taxpayers pay $50,000 to build out an asset in Wakefield that we don't own? is my question. Um, you're, you're paying for the program, and part of the program is for them to the upgrade of the facility. Okay. It, that was one of the areas that went back and forth. Yeah, <laughs> yes. uh, I'm not surprised. Okay, so it's, it's $2,500 per student. Um, but for this year, it's, it's no, not. It's, it's That's a flat fee. It's a flat fee. For this year? For this year, it's a flat fee. And then moving fee. forward, it's 2500 Because we student. told them we can't go higher than the amount that we've budgeted for. Okay. And if I'm looking at, if, if we look at the last page of it, the Reading share, I just want to make sure I understand the numbers. Yeah. So the, the very last page of the um, breakout of Appendix A, mm -hmm. it says $90,800. Oh, sorry, that's the that's Wayfield share. Change. Um, what is the 50% of construction? I guess it was 50,000, but I, I'm... One of the things that happened was when we started, um, Wakefield uh, wanted to include, to recoup some of the construction costs, which started to drive up our cost higher than the 150,000 we had budgeted for. So Appendix A is really showing you the total program cost. The cost to Reading for this first year is $150,000. So if you were to add up all these items here for Reading Share, you would come up to closer to 210,000, which mm -hmm. we, we pushed back to Wakefield and said, we, we can't afford that, we didn't have it budgeted. This isn't what we initially discussed um, in terms of what we could accommodate within our budget for this year. And that's where we, we came to the agreement, thank you to the town manager and the town administrator in Wakefield, where this first year it's, it's $150,000. This Appendix A is really just <coughs> numerating for you what the total program cost look like. I, 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 you probably answered it and I just didn't hear it, so I apologize. But the, what is the 50% of construction cost? Like when will we be done with the 2,500 per year charge back? Well, we're gonna negotiate what, we're, what it's gonna look like in year two and three. This is just for the first year, correct? Correct. I've got yeah. you, this gets us through year one. Thank you. The, the other yeah. thing, there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of costs that are estimates right now as well um, that may not, these are high-end costs is what we're being told. And so the true costs will be developed as the year goes on. One last question. Mm -hmm. So this agreement is for one year. Fantastic. So. Thank you. Actually, that helps me very much. Thank you. Yeah. A couple things. We'll, we'll, we talked earlier about the, the delay. Uh, is there any pro rata uh, for the delay in terms of what we have to pay uh, for that? No, it's it's part of the reason we were able to get it for the price for the amount that we had budgeted for. Okay. Because the program's going to be in our facility. Okay. So and I guess you know I guess I wish I would have known that we actually had space uh, to potentially house this or to house this program <coughs> before we uh, because you know we're bringing in you said Wakefield plus our Reading students and. You know, this was sold as, you know, we were losing EMARC. Was it EMARC? EMARC, yep. And, mm -hmm. You know, we have to find some place to go with it. And when we got in, into a, you know, a, a situation where, you know, all of a sudden we found space, I guess I'm concerned by that. So we didn't actually just find space. I mean, we, we were 
scrambling to try to find where was this program going to be for six months. Both Wakefield and Reading were looking for space. Um, I, I think what's important is that when we were going through the budget process last year, we, we had not had any conversation with Wakefield. We didn't even know Wakefield was thinking about this. We were going to do this on our, on our own. Um, Wakefield came forward with this way for this program, which is a fabulous program for, for these students. Um, and it gives us the ability to create a program, regardless of the number of students in it, to have a consistent amount of funding as years go on. What that amount of funding is, we're going to see at the end of this year. Now, if we feel that it's too high, we can go back to running our own program again. Uh, but right now, we feel that this is a very strong uh, alternative for our students. It gives them the job coaching skills that they need um, to become more independent. Yeah, and I'm not, I, my comments have nothing to do with the program. It's about where it is. Uh, and now we have it in our own building where when we first started talking about this, we didn't have a place, so we had to go look elsewhere. Well, I don't feel that this is an optimum location long term where it's going to be for, for six months. Yes. I actually, um, I have a reaction to the space question. Um, if this weren't a stopgap, then I would be raising the question about using the staff gathering space on an <coughs> ad infinitum basis for this program because without this space, what was said is that the teachers will be in their individual departments for lunch. And they, they are now. They are, but by choice, right? So it would take away the option for them to mix at the copier. It would take away the option for them to have lunch together across departments if they didn't have this communal teacher space? It, yes and no. I, it, because of its location, it's so far away from the classrooms, it, it's not going to be uh, an easily accessible space to have lunch together, to copy things together. It, it's, that's why they do most of their collaborating in their individual department spaces. Okay. I know there was concern about having the copiers way down in the bowels of the building because they have to get there and to do that. Time. Sorry? They have limited time mm -hmm. for both lunch and kind of break for the <coughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Is the motion made? Did you have to read? I apologize. Move to authorize the superintendent and board of selectmen to enter into an <coughs> intermunicipal agreement with the Wakefield Public Schools to provide collaborative post-secondary special education programs. Second. Second. Any other discussion? No. All those in favor of the motion? Opposed? Six zero.
extended leaves, whether it's a, a paternity leave, and uh, so they, they convert to unpaid, and so there's savings there. So that, that's where the majority of the savings came from. Thank you. Yes. So, but there's a savings, but then isn't there a cost associated with filling those positions? Um, well, an average teacher daily rate is, is anywhere from the low end of $300 to the high end of 450 and we pay 125 for a long-term sub. So, so when a teacher goes out on an unpaid leave, there's a, there's a savings to the district. Okay. And then this is money. kind of my first yeah. foray into, you know, really examining the numbers. There, mm -hmm. there are a lot of overages, and, you know, within some of the, the line items. So where does that... I guess do we account, we assume <laughs> we assume there's going to be saving savings so the overages are okay. Or? And, and and forgive me because some of these um, we the updates that happened prior to your coming onto the committee. So for example, where Eaton has an overage of seventy one thousand dollars, we hired three additional paras this year at Eaton because of the class size of the kindergarten accounts, uh, the kindergarten classroom. So some of these overages are were explained earlier and 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 forgive me I, I didn't give a more detailed update on that, but. The, um, and some of the some of the overages are just, you know, some of the gains that happen with replacing leaving faculty don't happen in every cost center. So uh, we might have you know, overages. <coughs> in that okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Can I just continue, yes. Robin? Yes. So, do we vote on that return of the 190? How does what goes on with that? I, I didn't hear the question. Do so we vote on the reason? Return of no, the free no. Cash. That just goes back to free cash. Okay, so we're returning 190 thousand on the uh, school budget and 16 thousand on the town maintenance budget being returned to the town. Correct. Right. We uh, we don't have a vote on. Okay. That. No. Yeah. Uh, the facilities you want, update. You want to do yeah. the facilities? Um, so I, I put in your packet a, a fairly detailed memo of where, where we are with facilities. Um, and I've been keeping you up to date in between meetings on what's been going on. So um, as you know, when we, we've been having, uh, town manager and I have been having conversations about the facilities department for, for a few months now. And in terms of how we can create a greater oversight uh, for both the, the town and school um, level. In July, uh, we had the resignation of Kelly Colon as the director of facilities, which kind of accelerated the discussions in terms of what should we do next because we were looking to find a, a director of facilities and maybe this was the opportunity to start looking at the restructuring a little bit differently. So through the discussions, um, and the chair and vice chair, both the school committee and the select committee were involved in this as well, as well um, we've come up with a, a, an informal plan which has to go through certainly several steps, um, including uh, a school committee vote, a selectman vote, and a town meeting vote, um, into what this would look like. And so, what it, what we'll have is actually the, the development of a, a new department um, called uh, town facilities or core facilities, you know, whichever whichever the case may be. And that department will consist of anything that deals with the maintaining um, and the utilities of the facilities. So it would include your director of facilities, um, the secretary uh, that is involved in the facilities department, and our three maintenance staff, um, we have a plumber, we have an electrician, and we have a, a general uh, laborer for our, for our uh, facility staff. And then in addition to that is any budgetary operating costs involved with utilities and the upkeep and maintaining of those facilities. So extraordinary maintenance, general repairs, preventative maintenance, all of those operating costs would go into this new department. The cleaning of the school buildings, the custodians, the custodial services, the cleaning company, um, that would still remain under the school department budget. Um, and as well as the, the supervisor of custodians would remain in, in the budget. And 
the facilities rental manager would remain in the school department budget. Um, what Martha and the town accountant right now are figuring out is what costs belong in this new department and what costs remain in the school department budget. And that's going to be presented um, on the 16th at the financial forum. So going through the, the timeline, oh, I should back up, is that on August 17th, uh, we appointed Joe Huggins as the acting director of facilities um, as this process is going on. Uh, Joe's impact has been felt immediately. Uh, you've seen several of the facilities uh, happenings this summer. Uh, Joe continued to make sure that that was all going along. Uh, the capital projects that were involved, that he stayed on top of those. Um, you saw how clean the buildings are. You walked through here and, and some of the other schools. So um, he is. He just he just kept the ball rolling for us so that we would have an easy transition for the start of school. The timeline now moving forward is that uh, in September there will be a uh, financial forum where this there will be further discussion of this. The budget numbers will be uh, shared. Uh, it is scheduled that evening the school committee will take a vote and the board of selectmen will take a vote um, on this new structure. If that if that moves forward, then in November there will be an article in town meeting um, for the to approve this new structure for the budgetary uh, changes that would occur as a result of this. Essentially, what we're talking about. Um, is approximately $2 million out of the school department budget is gonna get moved to this new budget. And Martha and uh, Sharon Angstrom are working on the specific numbers, um, and we'll have those ready for, for the financial forum. Mm -hmm. The other piece that I think is important when it, is that this new department will uh, be supervised, or the director of facilities will be supervised by both the town manager and the superintendent of schools and the school committee and the board of selectmen will vote on these budgets each year uh, for this town department, for this new town department. Um, so you will see exactly the costs associated with the maintaining and heating and lighting of the schools and the town buildings, and you will vote on it like you have in the past, as well as now the board of selectmen. In terms of the supervision piece, um, both the town manager and the superintendent will be supervising the director of facilities. Um, I will take the lead on the evaluation process. I've talked to the town manager about this. We will follow a similar process as we do here with the administrators in this district um, with a goal setting process at the beginning of the year, um, the development of a plan, a uh, mid-year review, and then an end of the year review. There will be a one year evaluation like all of our other administrators have. Um, so I guess now I'll open it up to discussion. Do you want to read the motion first? Uh, I apologize. I don't see it. The motion to just approve the memo. No, there's no, there's no vote yeah. to take tonight. This is okay. just discussion. Okay, thank you. There's no. Tonight is just discussion. This is just Your an vote is going to be taken at, um, at the financial yeah. forum. Thank I, you. Uh, when, when we talked, I felt it was good to have a discussion this evening and not take a take Sorry. Yeah. No, no, thank you. I, just have, I think this yes. is such a great idea. I mean, to, to move some of the facility maintenance out of the school. Um, I just I think it's very helpful. I think it's important to have someone overseeing it that has a background in, cons in construction and facilities management. I think this is a terrific idea. And I think that also, too, um, it's great to have someone that has a good knowledge of writing in the district. But I have a question. It's an appointed position. We, do we not, like, post it, or is there not an open rec, or, or is there anyone else considered for the position? How did, how, like, how no one was considered this time for this position, no. Okay. Can, can I just clarify, just, just so you know, the, the model in the past, there was someone, there was a director of facilities that, 
oversaw both town and school facilities. The big change now is that it's now going to be a shared responsibility between town and schools, whereas before everything was under the school department. Right. There was a director of facilities before this change was made. Yes, I understand that, okay. but, I, I think, so, but, I, but I just, I think it's... And Joe Huggins was actually in that role up until a year ago. Right, right, so but he hasn't been in it for the past year, and I just, I think his expertise is, yes. is, is, is going to be very helpful. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Robinson. I, I also agree. I think it's great to have Joe back, but I just want to say that I think that, um, I, you know, moving it, I, I, I don't think that there was any lack of ability and expertise and getting the job done because it was reporting strictly to the school committee previously. Um, so I, I think this is a good step. Um, I think it's, uh, I think there's been, you know, sort of discussions either in the foreground or the background for a long time about how this happens. I think when you look at the square footage that um, is schools, it's it really, really important that then this position reports to both the, the schools and the town and, and, or the town manager, the superintendent and the town manager. And definitely, I feel just from a square footage perspective that it, it wouldn't have been appropriate to switch that strictly to the town manager. And there have been discussions in the background. So I also think that we have done a really good job in Reading to be, to be one town, to be town and schools together, to do our best to do that. When budgets are tight, it gets sometimes challenging. Um, but this is truly a position where the director will report to both the town manager and the superintendent. And from that perspective, I think the name of the position should be something other than town. I think it should be core. I think it should be municipal. I think it should be something that says we are really talking about both town and schools together. I know a lot of people make an effort when we, we talk. We say, you know, town and school or municipal and school. And I think that that's important. But I think for this position where it does report to both, and that's very unique, uh, that it should have, the name should indicate that. And, and I think that's still up for discussion. Yes. Uh, the, uh, throughout the word core, that maybe that's what it should be. That's, you know. Mm -hmm. So I, I just think that's important because the community needs to know. And um, uh, I saw Joe just walk in, so. We were all saying how thrilled we are that Joe's, Joe's <coughs> acting or interim right now. Yes. So in the, I've seen this, this model work in other places, so I think it's good. I'm, I'm in favor of it. But typically, the finance director was responsible overseeing it. Is that in the past? That, that's not going to happen anymore? Margaret's not going to. Martha, I mean, sorry. Okay. It's not going to be involved in it. No. No. Certainly, it, Martha will be involved in the budgetary side for the custodians and the cleaning service and anything that deals with the cleaning of the schools, she would still be involved with that in terms of the budgetary piece. So what changes from, from Martha? Does anything change? Um, the, the whole procurement process now is shifted to the town side. Tonight you're voting on some contracts. In the future you will not be doing that. Um, that's going to shift over to the Board of Selectmen. They would be voting on those contracts. All procurement? I'm sorry? Any procurement if we're buying? Procurement that deals with facilities. OK. Not, not all right. procurement, but procurement that deals with facilities. Um, so those are the big changes that, that I believe are. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, I just actually a clarifying point to that. It, um, although that will happen, I just want to clarify that the same procurement laws are in effect. Oh, so, so oh, yes, you know, yes. all of those laws will be followed, yes. and, oh, and yes. the board of selectmen will be limited in the exact same ways that we are limited, yes. you know, in terms of lowest responsible bidder. <laughs> no, actually, uh, Sharon and I have had a number of thoughtful discussions about it. We met initially back in August with, with uh, Dr. Doherty and, and the town manager. The four of us got together, and Sharon and I have met twice already, and we're meeting later on this week to really fine tune what the budget looks like and. That was one of the things that she commented about today is that a, a lot of the stuff that I was financially responsible for is, is going to go over the town side now. So, Can I make so I guess I'm uh, just trying to fix. So, where it's going to be joint, kind of a joint uh, 
leadership now with you and the town manager, so why wouldn't we be voting on the contracts as well? Uh, I think that's, that's, that's an interesting question. I don't, I don't have the answer though, I have to talk to him for that one. Yeah. I think that's something we need to ask yeah. the financial yeah. board. Yeah. Okay. That's a good one. Yes. I, I, I guess I just want to comment that I think we've heard a couple of different things tonight, the post program and this, where if we go back to sort of last year's town meeting, there was a lot of emphasis on, you know, looking for where you can leverage other other uh, communities or other resources and combine. And I think this is certainly a great. Uh, I think we're taking some great steps forward, and we need to be cognizant that we're doing that, and we're working hard to do that. And so, hopefully, there'll be you know other opportunities. I think, especially though, with the schools, though, just like the post program. There are opportunities may exist with other school districts more often than a, a municipality, but of course this is a great synergy in terms of schools and municipal government in Reading. So. Yes. Will there be a cost savings in this? Or? No, there, there won't be a cost savings. Um, in fact, at November town meeting, there is the possibility that there will be um, a request made for additional staffing. Um, in 2010, I believe, we, 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 we caught a assistant director's position. Um, there is a need to put that position back in with all of the things that are going on in, in both the, the town and the schools. So that is, I believe, a request that's going to be made at town meeting. And in addition, an additional custodian on the town side, when the library comes on board, you'll have additional square footage. Uh, yeah, and so it won't be a cost savings. It's just, this sort of piggybacks on what Mrs. Webb said, but I think it bears stating that it, it's a bit of a cliche at this point to say that a strength of Reading is our ability to collaborate across areas, and it's absolutely true. This would not be possible if Dr. Doherty didn't work as effectively as he does with the town manager, or our colleagues on the board of selectmen didn't work as effectively with us. So I think you bring up a really valid point mm -hmm. that um, this is something to be proud of, that we can even, there are communities where this conversation can even happen. So I think um, I'm very proud of the tenor and tone of the discussion, and I think it represents a huge step forward in terms of efficiencies of service. Um, so. I think it's good. I also did want to state that the first time I became aware of the structure was a year ago at a conference that Dr. Doherty and I attended where the seminar was on cost savings in districts and a director of facilities had this exact structure. And after the discussion, I went up to him and said, well, that's different than what we do in my town. Um, so this does exist in other places and works really well. So, good. so uh, I see our... Uh, Yes, I was just going to, yeah, um, I don't know if you want to do the, the, these contracts first and then go to executive session. Yeah, let's do that. And yeah. then you can, open, you can always do the evaluation afterwards. Okay. Yeah. So contracts? Contracts. Yeah. Shall I? Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chair, move to authorize the superintendent to enter into contract with combustion services to provide boiler maintenance and repair. Is there a second? Second. Any questions? Discussion? Do I speak a little bit about sure. it? Sure. <laughs> okay. so, um, so this is a, you're seeing a lot of these because they're on a, a, a cycle and, and we do um, go out to bid for three year periods of time where we have a one year contract where we have the option to renew for year two and year three, um, which is helpful for budgeting purposes because then we know what our, our anticipated costs are going to be. Um, so this, all four of these that you're going to vote on this evening are all under that kind of umbrella of where we've gone out to bid. Um, for the boiler and uh, repair contract, combustion is the, uh, the current uh, contract holder, um, and they were the lowest responsive and responsible bidder. Thank you. Anyone have any questions for Mark? All those in favor? Six, six, zero. Yep. Mr. Chair, move to authorize the superintendent to enter into contract with cooling and heating specialists to provide HVAC maintenance and repair. For a second. So again, uh, cooling and heating is the, uh, the current uh, contract holder. Um, they were very aggressive, as you can see from the bids, they were very close 
terms of uh, PJ Dion um, was within a few thousand dollars of cooling and heating. Um, we've had very good service from them over the last three years, and we're very happy to continue with them. Their contract renewals for year two and year three are, are very marginal, um, <coughs> which, is, uh, which is a nice thing for us in terms of budgeting FY17. Mm -hmm. Questions? All in favor of the motion? Six zero. Mr. Chair, move to authorize the superintendent in to enter into contract with Motion Elevator to provide elevator testing, inspection, repair, and maintenance. Is there a second? Second. Second. So this is one where um, the wow. big results were, were drastically yeah. different. And um, as, as Joe can tell you and I can tell you as well, um, our bids are structured in three different areas. It's, it, uh, it calls out for a cost for labor, um, a cost for materials, and a cost for the monthly testing. The three bidders, the three responders, were, were very close on the first two components, the labor and the materials. It was on the third component of the bids where they were, they were drastically different. And um, Embry Elevator, who came in in the middle, is our current vendor. Um, Motion Elevator, uh, came in aggressive, they wanted the business. Um, Mr. Huggins and I both, uh, well he reached back out to them to confirm that they were comfortable with their bid response, that they hadn't made any, you know, there were no obvious errors in calculation when we, when I did my review of it. Um, but because it was so much lower than, than the other two respondents, um, they were comfortable with their bid, they st stood by their bid, and uh, we let them know that we're gonna hold them to their bid. And, uh, and to the services that are called out in the contract. And so uh, this is an area where we are gonna see some decreases in our expenses for the next year. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so was there anything that you found that would lead you to believe that there was a, a real reason that their cost could be so low? Because otherwise, you know, and I suppose we could get through a year, but they might not be in business in a year and then we just go out to somebody else. But I'm just wondering if you saw something that said, oh yeah, this company has a different, we can see they have a different cost structure and that's how we get, you know, $30,000. No, really where they were different in their bid was in the, uh, the monthly testing. So when they right. come in, the, the amount of money that they had in there for the monthly testing for each building, both right. the school and the town side, was much lower than what in right, reality. I guess I'm saying like, did you see something that said, how can they do that? Do they all run around with PDAs? I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, it would seem to me like monthly testing, unless they can do it a lot quicker, you know, they have to travel less or, I don't know, I just, I, I, it makes me feel uncomfortable. We, we have to approve lowest bids all the time and I would just feel a little bit. Well, they are a responsive bidder. I mean, we did check their references. I, I um, see that. I'm just saying, I just was wondering if you saw something that said, wow, this guy has a new bit, a different business model, and that's why, but it doesn't sound like it. Uh, we didn't go into that level of depth when we, we did the reference. I do know that the gentleman who uh, works for the company is a Reading resident and bid this job very aggressively. Oh. I don't know, do you want to, you check the reference? Do you want to see? I did check the references, obviously. Like Mark said, I called them up to make sure that they were comfortable with that number it is lower than what we're paying with them we've been at here for I think five or six years. Um, I reached out to them and made sure he was comfortable with his number and assured him that I was going to hold him to the monthly testing and we do keep track of the hours that they put in at the buildings. And I reached out to one of his references who had a similar situation with the pricing and they are having a great experience with this particular company. Um, they came in real low They're a small company. I think they operate quite a lower profit margin than a larger company can. Mm -hmm. So I believe they can do the work. Um, in the past, we have had vendors come in at low prices like this, and we watched them very closely, and we're not afraid to make a change. So if we feel like we're not getting the service that we're paying for, we won't hesitate to make a change with them. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Yes. I just want to second Elaine's comments because this is one of the laws that frustrates me the most lowest bidder. So are they suggesting that they, the monthly testing, they can do it in fewer hours than no, everyone else? No, they're not. No, he's uh, no, charging us a, uh, a lower hourly rate, I believe, is what it boils down to. It's based on time and materials. Yeah, the, the labor and materials were all the same. It was the, the, the fee for coming in on the monthly basis. It was, I think, $135 Really on the testing schedule where they, they want the contract. They're required to come out on the 
second Wednesday of every month to perform the service. And if we don't see them out here, and we, we have to, what we do is they'll call, come into the office, they sign in, and then we call ahead to a particular location so we know where they are in the district or where they are in town and school buildings. So we have a pretty good gauge on you know, how many hours they're spending and where they are. Um, and we do check to make sure we check slips, we check time, and we make sure that they're in there. Well, you know, it sounds like you haven't buttoned up, and I really appreciate that. I just, that number just jumped out at me when I was reviewing the materials. It's just such a significant difference. Um, I just wanted to thank um, Martha for including the references in every memo. I like, I love to see that. I always check, mm -hmm. and it's very reassuring to know that references were checked, and they're large municipal or educational organizations. So, mm -hmm. just I know it's standard operating pre procedure, but I do appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. All those in favor? Six zero. Yes. Can I make a suggestion? You have, you have some donations left. Yeah, we're going to hold those. Oh, you got one more? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. sorry. One more. Um, Mr. Chair, move to authorize the superintendent to enter into contract with Clarion Sprinkler to provide standpipe sprinkler and fire pump testing maintenance and repair. So, Is there a second? Uh, second. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, my gosh. Look at this one. So this one, uh, this one, the difference in the bid was $140 uh, between Clarion and Cogswell, and Cogswell was our current vendor. Um, this is one of those ones where, um, again, you know, Mr. Huggins and I discussed this one. Um, there's, there's not a lot of science into coming out and testing the sprinklers. Um, there's not a lot of lead time in, in terms of getting a new vendor up to speed on, on doing this sort of thing, so we're very comfortable. Um, clearance pricing was clearly the best, and uh, the references that were checked um, gave very good references for them. Um, and I, I feel like this is a great example of where we can feel comfortable that we got the best price. I mean, all three of these came in very close, and uh, the difference between the two uh, lowest bids was only $140. I think it's ridiculous that you can't stay with the guy now. Right. Yes. Can I just clarify? So the law says, though, that we cannot stay with the provider that we already have because they check out this way? Correct. You, you must go with the, uh, the least expensive, if you will. The, the most, they consider it the most responsive. The most responsive vendor is the least expensive. And he is a responsible vendor. So we have, we have two ways to re evaluate the, the bids. It's responsive. Did they include everything that they needed to in, in their bid submission, their bonds, their insurance, all those things? And they did. And then um, the other option is to, to look at their history, and, and that's the, through the reference check, and they are a responsible vendor. So uh, they are the responsive and responsible vendor. Yes. And, and the bids, I assume, are also closed. They have no idea what the other company is going to bid. Correct. When we advertise in the paper, it's a sealed bid that's due uh, by a certain time and a certain day, and we have a very a public opening and, and recording of those bids. Yeah, there they are. <laughs> <laughs> They're very entertaining. They can be. <laughs> just, just for, because this is all, this is another realm that I'm learning about. So with this world of Google and budgets that are public, is this something that a company could do their research on and find out what we paid last year for our provider? Absolutely. It's public record. These certainly these documents are public record. But um, again, I caution you. This doesn't mean we're going to spend seventy six thousand right. dollars with this vendor. It means that that's based on the bid specifications, which were tell us how much it would be for one hundred and fifty hours regular time, how much it would be for overtime. Give us your pricing structure, and we use the same mathematical e equations for all of them. So. This is not a guaranteed $76,000 contract for this person. Um, but it could be. Up to $76,000. Right? 
Uh, it, it could be more if we ended up needing it's more the hours. Rate, it's the rate yeah. that you're locking in. Yeah, it's the hourly rate we're yeah. locking in. Thank you. I guess as a, as a homeowner, um, there's a lot of leeway there for if we're I, I'm hearing that this is the rule and we have to follow the law. My concern is that if we have someone tried and true that has been performing well for us, there's a lot of leeway in terms of how they charge their time and how long it might take to do different fixes or between companies. So I, I'm a loyal, I have, I, I value loyalty as well. No, and, and I, I would suggest that we do as well, but I think that's where um, certainly Joe is, is going to manage any job that these, uh, that these vendors come in to work on. And if it's a, if it's a one-hour job, then we're only going to pay them for one hour. If they're here for four hours or five hours, we're going to question why they're here that long and, and challenge it. So we usually quote out any job that comes up um, with them, get, get an estimated hours from them, and you can look at it and say, is that reasonable? Yeah. How how long have we used Cogswell? Oh. We've been in Cogswell now um, six years. Wow. Ouch. Forty bucks. Thank you. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. All those in favor? Six zero. Okay. So at the outset of the meeting I said we were going to go into executive session at the end of the meeting I'm suggesting that we do that now because if, our, if I could yes. make a suggestion I would vote on the donations in the minutes I think there's minutes also right yeah. And, yeah. and then go into executive session and then postpone the evaluation to another time because we're going to be in executive session probably at least an hour Okay. Did you have two discussions you need to have? Yes. Can I respond to that? Sure. Um, I, I just want to say that if we go with that and we postpone the evaluation again, I just want to say a thank you for you, the superintendent, being willing for that to happen because this evaluation and his salary is, was supposed <coughs> to happen in June. Yeah. And so I think the superintendent has been very patient in waiting for this process to be able to happen. I so also I'm want to make sure the committee has, an, has a good conversation, not at 11 o'clock at night. Yes, that <laughs> makes sense. I'm, I'm not against it happening. I just want to appreciate your willingness to wait, because this is something that hangs over one's head. So. Hey, I'm going to go with that recommendation unless someone objects. Yes. Uh, no, that's great. I also just want to say to back up Linda's book, at the next meeting, let's make that the first sure. point of the agenda. Yeah, tonight so it was. Definitely get to it, and then also, too, the community can hear it as well. I think it's important. Please. Uh, so, the donations. Donations. Yep. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, move to accept a donation in the amount of $3,300 from the Reading Memorial High School Band Parents Organization to be used to support the coaching assistance for the recent band camp. Is there a second? Second. 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 Discussion? All those in favor? Six zero. Mr. Chair, move to accept an anonymous donation in the amount of $1,000 to be used to support a World of Difference program at Reading Memorial High School. Is there a second? Second. 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 Any discussion? I just had a question. Sure. We don't know the amount. One thousand dollars. Oh, oh, it's one thousand. Oh, I didn't. Okay. It I may not see it on my original one. Yeah. Okay. Right. Thank you. All those in favor of the motion. Six zero. Mr. Chair, move to accept the donation of snack shack equipment from the Reading Boosters organization. Can I give a little? Yeah, is there a yeah. Second. Yeah. Um, second. So, as you know, the the Boosters Club, or maybe you don't know, the Boosters Club has been overseeing the operation of the Snack Shack for about thirty years. Um, they are dissolving as an organization. Actually, they have dissolved as an organization, um, and so uh, they are they are donating the equipment that was in the Snack Shack uh, to the Reading Public Schools. So, what is going to happen? Uh, for this year is that 
the Ready Rotary Club is going to take over the operation of the Snack Shack um, for uh, events. And they will still have the relationships that, that the boosters did with Pop Warner and with the music uh, boosters um, because they also were, had uh, been involved in the Snack Shack operations. Um, the advantage of continuing to have a community organization run it like Rotary is that the funds that come from that organization go to many uh, other community organizations in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the town, uh, which Reading Rotary gives a lot to the schools already and will continue to do that. Um, in addition, Rotary is going to be um, doing some uh, work in the Snack Shack to upgrade it, paint it, clean it. Um, they've applied for a grant uh, for uh, $7,000 to purchase some additional equipment um, along with this. So um, they're, they're eager to do this. They're gonna involve students uh, in, in this. There's an Interact Club that's gonna be a, a part of this as well. Um, so it's a great opportunity for community service for students as well to be a part of the Snack Shack operation as well. With the boosters uh, dissolving, I we had talked about, but did, has most of their other work other than the snack shop been absorbed by uh, individual sport uh, or club uh, parent they really, groups? In the last several years, they really haven't been involved in any other fundraising. This has been their primary uh, operation. They did uh, spend, I, I believe you accepted a donation for $5,000 in July uh, for a new golf cart for the uh, athletic trainer. Um, so that was like the remaining amount of funds that they had to, and they gave it back to the athletic department. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. If I'm remembering correctly, the boosters were always very generous for other things like jackets and helping out with expense, or am I confused looking at faces? Maybe in the past they yeah, were involved, not, in the uh, not recently. Not in the recent past. The, oh, okay. No, it's been all the friends of. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. It's really been a lot of the friends of. Yeah. 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 Okay. The boosters themselves have no, it's uh, and, and so the profits from the Snack Shack will go to Rotary, and Rotary will just continue to dispense yes. them to yes. <coughs> community businesses, uh, organizations. Thank you. I think that's great. Thank you. So not to, I, not to drag this on, but uh, so we'll have a discussion, I guess we should, uh, down in the coming months about how to handle that snack shack long term. I mean, I'm assuming the Rotary's just stepping in for this year. Um, they're going to monitor it for a year, and, and if, if they continue to have, I mean, it really depends on the amount of volunteers. Most. Most school districts that have a snack shack, Martha did some research on this, it is a community organization that runs it. Um, if you have, like a couple of years ago, we looked at if we wanted our food service department to run it, it, it actually, you don't make any money. In fact, you lose money because you have to pay for the labor. Right. Um, when you have a volunteer organization running it, you're not paying for the labor to run it. Up. So it's- I, I agree, I guess, I just wanna make sure we properly make that decision uh, with transparency and sure. we just don't give it to the Rotary. Uh, there's some other community organization that wants it. Uh, just, you know, for down the road. Yep. Yes. Really quick question. I can't imagine that there's an issue of liability, but did you think that through? Is, is there any issue of liability by having the a, a non-school associated group run the snack shack? Is Boosters there, was not associated with the schools. With the schools either, no. okay. Plus, Rotary has a liability policy. It's an international policy. Perfect, thank you. Yes? I would just like to say and acknowledge uh, Mr. Driscoll and, and the Boosters organization. They uh, did this very thoughtful tour down memory lane with the, the plaques that are on the wall, and they were very generous in donating a lot of equipment to us. So I would like to thank him for his, his years of support. Favor of the motion. Six zero. 
Mr. Chair, move to accept the donation of office supplies and furniture valued at approximately $8,000 from AVO, AVO Pharmaceuticals. Is there a second? Second. So uh, AVO Pharmaceuticals is the company that uh, Ms. Cologne worked for prior to coming to Reading, and they were consolidating their office space in Cambridge, and uh, they uh, reached out to her, or she reached out to them, I'm not sure, the sequence of events, but uh, the sum total of it is that we ended up with a lot of very nice office furniture, um, desks and cabinets, and uh, it's been being deployed throughout the district, and we talked earlier about some of the new offices that we've constructed. Um, one of the larger pieces of uh, the donation was what's called the media skate table, which we're not exactly sure where we're gonna put it yet. It might go in the maker space at the high school, um, but still to be determined. But that table itself has about an $8,000 value. If you were to Google, Question about the, the moving. Um, did they deliver it to us or did, did we was there a cost associated? Okay. All those in favor? Six zero. Mr. Chair, move to accept a donation in the amount of $4,500 from the Friends of Reading Wrestling to be used to support the coaching assistance for the 2015 16 season. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Six zero. Mr. Chair, move to accept a donation in the amount of $4,980 from the Friends of Reading Wrestling to be used to support the coaching assistance for the 2015 season. Football. Football, Football I apologize. It's getting late. <laughs> Thank you. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Six zero. Yes. Quickly, I just, I, I, Ms. Seibert touched on this, but it truly, it really is quite something how generous this private organization, there's loads of parent support and certainly the boosters. It's, we really do benefit greatly from the generosity of this community and our employees and uh, residents. So just wanted to say thank you. Those were a lot of very generous donations. Yes. Just a quick question. So I noticed the, red, the wrestling one uh, doesn't specify the code. We've talked about when you go through the process and then the football one specifies the coaches. Does that just mean that that process are, has already gone through and those assistant coaches are named? Or am I back in the year? Are these for last year? No, this is for the upcoming season, the upcoming 2015 mm -hmm. football season, and they, they've already been named, yes. Okay, whereas the ready wrestling practice one didn't quite have that information yet, or maybe did not. I know they have they have been been I know one assistant yet. coach recently left to do something else, so. Yeah. Okay. All right, I just wanted to make sure, though, that they also have gone through the process. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Chair, move to approve the open session minutes dated July 20th, 2015. Is there a second? Any discussion? All those in favor? Zero. Okay, so uh, we, uh, the committee, will now enter into executive session, uh, which is necessary to protect the litigation position of the committee. Mr. Chair, I move to enter into executive session to discuss strategy with respect to litigation and the approval of minutes and to not return to open session. Is there a second? Second. second. Mr. Nyan? Yes. Joyce? Yes. 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 Yes.